So welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening again. And I welcome all of you on behalf of Atorica for this session on the PMP refresher. And we are going to spend almost six hours together uh, refreshing some topic of sub topics of the PMP which you might have studied earlier or even if you have not studied uh, you know this course is going to give you a quick uh, and a very good overview of what this PMP is all about what are the course structure what are the different topics and uh, what are the tips and tricks to crack this examination and also most importantly demystifying some of the myths about the PMP examination so I'm sure uh, we are going to have a very good session and uh, I wish and uh, uh, all the best for everyone for the session and let's get started with this. Let's move ahead and a quick introduction about myself, your host and your trainer for the day. I'm Nishant Shukla. I'm sure you must have seen my profile there. I come with uh, close to 23 years of experience and uh, started working as a techie spend a good amount of time in technologies, various technologies, various domains, but gradually started moving to uh, various project management positions. And uh, when you move into the project management, it, it becomes more like a generic thing. So I worked on the project management and program management and also worked on portfolio management. And uh, along with my job, I also used to do training. So for past 11 years, I have trained close to 7,000 people across the globe and I've done things for some of the uh, very uh, rep uh, most reputed organizations in, in the world. If you <coughs> want to know more about myself, uh, I am there on the LinkedIn. I have my own page on Facebook. You can go there and you can get more details about it. But the journey was pretty interesting. It's been more than two decades and the journey was very interesting because training is something that I always, always passionate about. I enjoyed giving training on different topics. I do PMP, I do the various customized project management, process transformation, process management, leadership and soft skills programs as well. And uh, well, that's, that's uh, all about myself. As I told you, I am all there on the LinkedIn and Facebook. In case if you want to stay in touch, remain in touch for any reason, your PMP exam preparation or any career guidance, you can reach out to me. My contact details are all available there over the net. And you can reach out to the support team of Federica as well. They will connect you with me and I'll be able to help you with any queries that you might have. And uh, talking about the topics that we are going to cover today. So it's a very interesting agenda that we have and I have tried to make it short and crisp as well. We are going to talk about uh, the PMI and PMP, introduction of PMI and PMP, and we will discuss the myths about the PMP examination. Lot of myths, lot of myths. In fact, uh, I have seen some of the people who have cleared the PMP examination, even they have some of the uh, wrong information about the examination or the, the way it is uh, conducted, the way participants or the people who have taken the examination are get their, getting the result. Then we will move on to the introduction of project and project management. We are going to talk about the basic stuff, the very basics of the project and project management. And we will need know, understand what are the factors that influence the project. So during this, uh, from this point onwards, we will start talking about two different approaches. First is learning or understanding the topic from the examination perspective and also get to know uh, how we are going to use this principle and philosophies in the real life. Because real life scenario is, is completely different than what we say uh, in the book. And we, then we will talk about the process and the project management framework, how this PMBOK is structured. And we are also going to have a 360 degree overview of the PMBOK guide, fifth edition, which is a latest edition. And then I have put up some interesting topics here, that is understanding critical path, introduction to the on value management, and a few words about the risk management and uh, qualitative risk an analysis. Post that, uh, we will have some Q and, and Q and A session. So from this agenda, the, the heaviest or you can say the lengthiest topic is 360 degree overview of the PMBOK guide. For this topic, I do not have any slide. I have not prepared it intentionally. I'm going to share the PMBOK guide with all of you for this topic. And we are going to talk about the process map 
all the processes that we have in the PMP and what all we need to do from the examination perspective. Okay. So we are uh, all good to move ahead with our agenda and there we go. About PMI, so PMI is Project Management Institute, which is a not-for-profit profit association and it was established in 1969. Since then, PMI has been working and upliftment of the project management community. So it's not that before 1969 or before PMI or the PIMBO came into existence, there were no projects or the projects were not getting on time, completed on time. There were projects, there were programs, and there were huge, huge projects which actually were still being completed within time, within cost, and within scope. But what PMI did is they brought a framework which helped in bringing the standardization in the project uh, project management the way project was being managed so pmi is offering various certifications and those certifications are very well accepted and received and taken by all the industries across the globe okay? and uh, if you look at this slide, it talks about all the certifications that PMI has. They have added few more certifications. So you have PMP, you have CAPM, Program Management Professional, which is PGMP, Portfolio Management Professional, which is PFMP, Agile Certified Practitioner, which is PMI ACP, Scheduling Professional, Risk Management Professional, and uh, the most prominent and the most important certification from all this is PMP. There are more than 654,000 project management professionals across the globe, across the industries. It is, uh, uh, it is assumed that this number is growing at the rate of 12 to 15% every year. There are hundreds and thousands of member, active members of PMI across the globe. And eligibility criteria for each of these credentials that you see on the screen are different. So one of the things that people normally, uh, you know, perceive this is that this is a certification for the people who are in IT. Or this is the certification which will be useful for people in uh, construction industry. But that is not true. Anywhere, wherever you can find an element of the project, you will have to use project management. And wherever you use project management, your PMP certification, your PMP credential that we talk about is, have, is having a very significant value. So PMI, PMP certification or PMP credentials is accepted by all the industries, be it manufacturing, banking, finance, operations, construction across the globe. PMI has presence in more than 170 countries and uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, PMI has recently done a study where they identified some of the areas, some of the industries where PMP is going to grow a lot in future. So, okay, Jashin, I think there are some technical difficulties. Uh, we will keep monitoring and in case if we have something, uh, our support team is monitoring it, they will try to rectify it on the background. In case if you miss some of the part due to any technical difficulties from your side, you can always go through the recording which will be uploaded uh, in some time after the session gets over. Okay. So we were talking about this PMP certification. Let us understand what is the prerequisite for this PMP. So there are two different categories. If you are a degree holder, if you hold a bachelor's degree or engineering degree or any of the global equivalent of that, you need to have 4,500 hours of project management experience, which must come from minimum 36 months of experience. How these hours are calculated is something I will tell you when we go uh, to this uh, process groups in the PMBOK. But uh, to gain this experience or to be able to go for this PMP, uh, to apply for the PMP examination, you need not to be a designated project manager. You could have worked at any position, any role in the project. Suppose your team size is 100 and you are the junior most person in the team doing any coding or doing any supervision activity. But 
you are contributing towards a project. You are doing some work which is a part of a project. So whatever amount of time you are spending working on that project, that will be considered as your project management experience. So there is a predefined format for that. When you go to PMI website, you can go through that uh, application form and you need to give this information that how much time or how many hours of effort you have put in against each of the activities and that activity falls in which process group. So there are five process group initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling and closing and the total amount of time that you need to accumulate is 4500 hours in case if you do not have a degree you have just a diploma or any associate degree or global equivalent then you need to have 7500 hours of project management experience and uh, this experience must be from last eight years for example you are applying for the pmp examination tomorrow in 2015 and you specify that, okay, I worked on a project from 2001 to 2002. PMI is not going to accept that. So whatever experience you document in the uh, application form, that must be from last eight years only. You cannot go beyond that. In case if you do that, PMI holds a right to reject that application. Okay. And... Uh, out of all these applications, out of all this uh, application that PMI receive, they pick up 20% of these applications for audit. And 20% applications are picked up randomly. So if your application is picked up for audit, then whatever experience you have documented or you have provided in the form, PMI is going to ask you to, uh, to show you a proof of that. You need to give the written document uh, evidence and uh, there is a predefined format for that pmi is going to make you aware of the process you need to fill that up do the formalities submit these documents hard copies of the documents to pmi and then pmi is going to accept that or reject that or take any action on that once your application is accepted then you can go and book your examination so in the next slide i'm going to take you through the the detailed process and the steps that you need to uh, go through in order to become a PMP. These are the uh, charges that you have. If you opt for uh, computer-based testing, then depending on your PMI membership status, you may have to pay $405 or $555. So PMI membership uh, is separate from that. PMI membership, uh, you can apply for it and you can yeah, you need to pay $139 to become a PMI member. And once you become a PMI member, then you can. Yeah, once you become a PMI member, then if you go and apply for the examination, the fee will be $405. So there are some areas where the facility of paper based testing is also available. In case if you opt for paper based testing, then the fee is going to be $250 for PMI members and $400 for non-members in case if anyone failed in the first attempt or not able to clear the examination in the first attempt he will or that person will get opportunity after a 30 days time to reappear to go for the examination again and the re-examination fee is 275 dollars in case uh, you are no longer a member at the time of uh, re-examination, then you will have to shell out a fee of $375. And in case of paper-based, it is $150 and $300 respectively. So all these details are available in detail on the PMI website. You can go to www.pmi.org, go to the certification section, look for PMP certification and go through your uh, can go through your uh, PMP handbook. So PMP handbook is going to give you complete detail of what are the prerequisite, how you should apply for it, how you should fill up the form and all the details. After this uh, session gets over, when you're going to receive the mail, I will ensure that the link to PMP handbook is added into that mailer so all of you can access it directly. Alternatively, you can go to our website, Edureka, and go to the PMP page. There also you will get this important links to the website. Okay, moving on to the next 
PMP examination pattern. So PMP examination is a computer-based examination and across the globe it is conducted in prometric centers. There are no other centers uh, other than prometric, so you will have to go there. There are certain centers you can check with the PMI. There might be some region-specific or country-specific centers available as well and you need to check with the PMI whether the facility of paper-based examination available in your vicinity or not. So uh, computer-based examinations are conducted in traumatic centers and it's all they are all objective type questions. Each question will have four options and only one answer will be the correct one. There are 200 multiple choice questions which are mixed randomly across the process groups and the time you are going to get is four hours. So uh, on an average, you get approximately one minute and eight to nine seconds for uh, 200 questions because in 240 minutes, you need to answer 200 questions. Some of the questions will be smart, very like, you know, short questions, one or two liners. Some of the questions will be sort of paragraphs. And there are all 80% of the questions are scenario based questions. And uh, out of this 200 questions, 175 questions are marked for the final marking and remaining 25 questions are the pretest questions. So how this concept of pretest question and final marking question come into the picture? The PMI has, an, actually no one in the world knows that how many versions of the question paper PMI has. These question papers are developed by the professionals across the globe and uh, PMI keep on adding or removing questions from, questions from that. Before any question gets included into examination, PMI wants to ensure that the, the level of complexity and difficulty is appropriate in each of the question. So before they add it into the final marking question, they will probably do a sampling of that. They will add it up to the 100 exam, 100 question papers, and they will see how people are responding to that. If out of 100 people, let's say, any pre-test uh, pre question, out of 100 people who were chosen to check for this question, all of them failed to give the correct answer. Then PMI will assume that, okay, it is, it is very difficult, it's too complex, and they may exclude it from the final marking question. They may not include it into the final question paper in future. Suppose there is a question which is relatively easy, and all 100 people or more than 90 people or 95 people are able to answer that easily. Then again, PMI may rule out including that question in the final marking question in future. So they have their own way of checking. No one knows that what criteria they use, what algorithm use, use, they use, but they have their own way of checking the complexity of the question. So this is a very important point because people often get confused that are we going to uh, do, do, do we, are we going to get any notification or uh, can we see which, uh, which of the questions are pretest question and which of the questions are final market questions? No. When you go for the examination, you will have to take all those 200 questions with the same level of seriousness and same level of attention you need to pay to all 200 questions because you will have no idea which one is a final marking and which one is a pretest question. And there is no negative marking in the examination. This examination is developed by the groups of individuals from around the globe who hold the PMP credentials and who are volunteers with working with the PMI. And uh, these people are from different industries, not necessarily only from IT or only from construction. No, these people are from all the industries. And uh, when you go for the examination, you take the examination. Okay, when you take the examination, you will get the, if it is a computer-based examination, you will get the result immediately within a minute's time on the screen after the question is submitted, the, the, the question paper is submitted, they will tell you whether you have cleared it or not. And then within maximum two months time, depending on the geographical location, where you are, which country you are, you will receive a hard copy of the certificate from the PMI. That is a maximum time frame. Generally, I receive, I received it in two weeks time. Okay, so there is a question and Mr. Sanjeev is asking, will we be getting PDU credit for this webinar? Can we claim in PMI website? Yes, if you are a PMP, you are going to get six PDUs 
and for that you need to complete the entire session and then you're going to receive this PDUs which can be useful for you to renew your PMI credentials. Those who are not PMP, we will talk about, uh, we'll discuss about what is PDU and uh, you know when and how you need it and how you're going to use it in the future. And uh, moving to the next topic, which is very, very important, is myths about the PMP examination. So first is aspirants need 35 PDUs to apply for the examination. No, the terminology is wrong. You don't need 35 PDUs to apply for the PMP exam, but you need 35 contact hours. Once you take the training, which is a four days PMP exam preparation workshop. You do this training at end of this train, that training, you're going to receive a certificate, which will give you 35 contact hours. Those contact hours are required for you to be eligible to, or to become eligible to apply for the PMP examination. And once you apply for the exam and you clear it and you become PMP credential holder, then you need to maintain that credential for uh, credential and for that you need to earn 60 PDUs over a period of three years time. Okay, PDU stands for professional development unit and uh, each hour spent in any recognized any project management activity recognized by PMI is going to give you one PDU. So <clears throat> that's about the uh, PDUs here. And uh, next point here is the passing scores for PMP examination. Until sometime few years back till 2006, November 2006, uh, 2005, PMI used to calculate the percentage. If you're, uh, they used to take calculate the percentage to decide whether any uh, participant has cleared the exam or not. But they stopped this approach from November 2005 and they started providing the grades. Each of the per question in this examination has a different value, will have a different uh, weightage depending on the complexity of the question. And the way they check the result is uh, they do an analysis of that. So it becomes a sort of psychometric analysis to calculate, to check how comfortable the person is in taking this complex examination. Okay. okay, so let me just give a look at the question. There are a few questions coming here. Okay, Lee Adams is asking if you're not a PMP yet and you are taking a class for the pre-cert plus this webinar, do the extra hours add up to anything? No, unfortunately, no. You will have to go for a specific PMP exam preparation workshop. This is just a PMP refresher and uh, this is going to serve different purpose of the different people. Those who have completed their PMP examination, they're already PMP credential holder, they are going to get six PDUs, but those who are not and who have done some kind of training in past, so this is going to give them a good refresher. So they can brush up their topics before they take up the examination. And those who have not done any certification, any training in this one, this session is going to give them a complete overview of what it takes to be PMP. Okay, and uh, Mr. Imran is asking, I want to, want to submit my application for PMP. Okay, I want to become PMI member after my application is approved. Uh, you need not to wait for approval of your application. In fact, I would suggest that first you become PMI member and then you apply for it. So of course you're going to get some benefits in terms of uh, application rebate on the application fee, but there are a lot of other benefits as well. You will get access to a lot of free resources. You will be able to download certain things, certain documents on there. You also get access to their, their uh, forums, which can be quite useful. Okay, uh, Shanti is asking. Okay, okay, I can understand Shanti, you are at work, but uh, after this session gets over, the recording will be available, made available to everyone and it will be uploaded uh, on the blog section of Edureka website and you all will receive a link to this, uh, for this uh, webinar, recording of the webinar, which you can go through later. And in case if you have any questions in future, feel free to contact our support team and we'll ensure that, you know, it is, it is being answered. 
Okay, and Shiv Kumar is asking: Is PMI membership fees for lifetime? No, uh, Shiv Kumar, it is only for one year. PMI membership is hundred and thirty nine dollars, which is applicable for which is for the membership is for one year. Okay, so uh, moving to the next topic is uh, we are talking about the PMP examination score. So as I told you, there are no percentage given. It's not that each question carries one mark and you need to score some hundred and five or hundred and six marks to clear the examination. No, that is not the way. It's a sort of psychometric assessment and PMI uses some algorithm to uh, check uh, whether the participant is, has cleared or not and also to define the grades. So the grades are uh, below more proficient, proficient and moderate proficient. Okay. And uh, another point is people say that to clear the PMP examination, you must memorize everything that is there. If anyone comes and if any person says that, you know, I have a photographic memory, I just need to read through this PMBOK cover to cover and I'll be able to clear that. No, the likelihood of that person failing the examination is going to be very high. PMI expects you to understand the concept. Okay, there are more than 520, uh, 516 ITTOs in PMBOK Guide, in the 6th, 5th edition of PMBOK Guide. And memorizing all these ITTOs is not going to help you. In fact, it becomes very difficult also to memorize because then there are not just ITTOs, there are a lot of other things also. But when you go for the PMP exam, you'll see that around 80% of the questions are scenario based question. You will be given a scenario where you will be playing the role of a project manager and then based on the situation and based on the guidelines of PMI, which are given in the PMBO guide, you need to take a decision. Of course, there will be few questions where they will specifically ask you whether what is the input to this process or which of the following is a tool or technique in the particular process. There would be few questions like that, but for that you can actually use, you can apply some, uh, some you can create some memory map, mind maps here and you need to apply certain logics here. What are the logics? We are going to talk about that in some time. And uh, these are the myths, some of the myths, not all the myths, but some of the myths of the PMP examination. And I suggest everyone that when you are preparing for the PMP examination, do not rely on the information that you may get from the different sources. Even if the person is PMP, but I would still suggest you go to PMI.org and clarify your doubts here. Get hold of PMP handbook that will give answer to most of your questions. If you still have any question, you can always reach out to me or you can reach out to the support team of Fedureka. Alternatively, you can also write to PMI at info at the rate PMI.org and they will respond to your query. And uh, let me just have a look at this question. Imran is asking, in case I get my application rejected, then I won't get any benefit of being a member. The main purpose is to get PMP credential. Imran, what I can suggest is after the session, you can drop in a mail to me. You can reach out to me. I will share my contact details and uh, you can give me a detail of the kind of experience you have. And I will, uh, we can have a discussion, offline discussion. I will guide you how to fill up the form in case if you eligible are eligible for the PMP examination. So the likelihood of your application getting rejected will be minimized, but provided you fulfill the minimum criteria to be uh, to become eligible for the examination. Okay. Okay. Uh, with this, we move on to the next topic, which is uh, a question which I have seen everyone ask that how much time I should spend in preparing for the examination, how long it will take to prepare for the examination. A couple of weeks back, I, I actually you know, came across a question where a person asked said that, you know, one of his, that person's friend prepared for the PMP examination just for one week and he cleared the examination. Of course, that person might be a super genius and uh, you can clear that there is nothing, nothing is called impossible in this world. But I would suggest that you follow, you prepare a plan. You need to prepare a strategy how you're going to clear the PMP examination. And for that, I have prepared this slide, which will be quite useful, quite helpful. 
So what you see here on the screen is a, a complete uh, roadmap how you should go about it. So first step that I suggest that I tell everyone is you must become a PMI member first. There are a lot of benefits of becoming a PMI member. You can also when you are apply for, when you apply for the PMI membership, you can also buy the membership of uh, your re local PMI chapter because this will help you connect with the other PMPs in your vicinity. This is good from the networking purpose and also you will get access to the PMBOK guide. After you become PMI member, you will be able to download the PMBOK guide, the latest edition of PMBOK guide. So what is PMBOK guide? If you are not aware of that, I will. Uh, we are going to uh, cover that topic as well. So when you get this uh, PMI membership, you are going to get this PMBOK guide, which will be exclusively for you. It will come with your, your name and your PMI ID. And that will be that will come handy when you go for the training. It will always it will be good if you can just go through it uh, before you attend the training. So you use this training as a session where you can clarify your doubts. And after you become for the PMI, uh, they become the PMI member, then you attend the PMP exam preparation training, which is uh, uh, thirty five, which is going to give you the thirty five contact hours training. So that training is uh, in, in some people prefer a continuous four day training. Some people prefer uh, two weekends training. Some like in Adureka, we have a training which is split across four weekends because people may not be able to pull out full a nine hours time every day. So we have split this into four four hour session, which will go on for four weekends. Okay. Uh, so after you complete the training, you're going to receive a 35 contact hour certificate, which will make you eligible to apply for the PMP examination. And then you go ahead and apply, submit your application. I would prefer, I would suggest that you submit this application online on the PMI website. Once you submit the application, PMI is going to take some time, which may be maximum from one to three weeks, depending on uh, the information that you have, uh, you know, entered there, they are going to verify that. And after a few days of submission of your application, PMI will come back to you saying that uh, your application, your credentials have been verified, have been checked and you are eligible. And then you, they will ask you to make the payment. And uh, if you have taken the PMI membership, then you need to pay $405 of the examination fee. The moment you submit your fee and your payment is accepted, you need to use your credit card, international credit card to make the payment. The moment it is accepted, at that time you will be notified whether your application has been picked up for audit or not. If your application is not picked up for audit, the entire process of submitting the application and approval will take maximum a week's time. Uh, generally five business days, so one calendar week. If it picked up for uh, audit, then you know, uh, depending on how, with what speed you submit all the requirements, you fulfill the client needs. So you are going to get 90 days time to complete the audit requirement and audit process. At that time, you need to, you need to, uh, whatever experience you have mentioned or document in the application form, you need to give a proof, provide a proof of that. So when you submit your form, you need to give a reference of any person who worked with you in that particular project, what you have mentioned in the form, and you need to get a written, a hard copy of the form filled by that reference and submit it to PMI. So PMI will make you aware of the process. They will inform you about the detailed process that you need to follow. And uh, once you fulfill the all the audit requirement, your application will be reviewed and they will approve or reject depending on the fulfillment of the requirement. If your application is rejected, PMI is going to deduct $100 from that and will refund you $305. $100 is towards the administrative expenses. If your application is approved, then you're going to receive a link from PMI saying that your application has been accepted. You go ahead and schedule your examination. So the day you receive that email from PMI, from that day, you're going to get one year's time to clear the PMP examination. Okay, so Anthony is asking, can I download the slides? Uh, after the session is over, the slides will be uploaded on uh, uh, uploaded on your uh, slide share and the recording will also be available there. You can refer to these slides here. In case if you have any further question, 
you can always reach out to us. And Sanjeev is asking a question. Okay. Uh, yes, Sanjeev. So what Sanjeev is saying is I got selected for audit and as part of the audit document, I got a PDF already prepared by the PMI. Yes. So that is the format in which you need to uh, fill up the information and get it signed by your manager. Yes. Generally, that is the that that's the thing that you need. Okay. John, I'm coming to that part. I'll, I'll just come to that part. Okay. So Sanjeev. Uh, you need to check with the PMI. I'm sure PMI must have informed you. So if they need anything extra, for example, if you said that you work in a ABC company from, uh, you know, uh, 2009 to 2011 and you worked on a project during that time, all you need to do is fill up a form which you receive from the PMI, get it signed by your manager or any stakeholder whose reference you gave while submitting the application and submit to PMI. In case PMI has any doubt about that uh, document, they may come back to you and ask, ask you to submit any other proof like your experience certificate. Generally, they don't ask it. Okay, and it is quite subjective. I have not seen in many cases PMI going to that level of detail. So I think if that information is correct as per PMI guidelines, then that should suffice. Okay. okay. So once your application is approved and you receive the mail, go ahead and block the examination day. So you can go to the Prometric website and block the date and I suggest around 110, 120 to 140 hours of studies for the PMP examination. Now, depending on whatever amount of time you can pull out every day, you need to see whether you can do this in 30 days time. You can, you need to do this in 45 days time or six uh, or 60 days time. That is completely on your schedule, that is completely on your availability. But I would strongly suggest if you are planning to study one hour every day, don't do that. The minimum time you must take out to prepare to study every day is two hours because it's not that you will open the book, you'll open your study material and right from that moment, you will be completely engrossed into that. It takes some time to get into that rhythm. So. I suggest you pull out at least two hours every day with some additional time during the weekends. So the ideal time between the training and your scheduling the examination and taking the examination must not exceed eight weeks. That's the ideal time. But of course, it is subjective depending on your availability, depending on your schedule at your workplace, you can block it. But the important point is when you are going to take the examination, make sure two weeks before that the momentum of the studies is very high. And how you should prepare for the examination is uh, this is the area where normally people make some mistake. Uh, what they do is right from the day one, they jump to the mock test or mock questions. No, don't do that. I suggest, I will sincerely suggest that first you focus only on studying, learning the concept, learning the, uh, understanding the concept and go through all the chapters of the PMBOK guide and use some additional reference material as well. And once you have done that, then you start working. Once you have done one cycle of reading and that is the time you should start picking up the mock test and you should start doing the questions there. So we are going to talk about that in detail when we move to the later topics here. So after you have done your studies for four to six weeks, I think you should be ready to take the examination. You need to go ahead and take the exam and I'm sure you will be, you'll be able to clear it in first attempt. And once you become, we clear that you will earn that credential and then you need to maintain it. So the validity of this PMP credential is three years and you need to renew it after every three years. And during the three years time, you need to earn 60 PDUs to renew that PMP certification. So if you look at the lower side of the slide, this is the area where PA Edureka is going to provide you help and support. Right from taking up the training, 
still taking you through your audit process and application uh, assistance in application filling up and then your personalized guidance plan from by SME. You know, our SMEs will guide you uh, uh, when you attend the training here because we will be able to keep a track or keep a tab on each person's ability and the score and also their learning experience. Based on that, our SMEs can guide you, can give you a personalized study plan that how you should go about it. And, uh, you know, when you reach to a point where you need to start taking the mock test and mock questions, we have more than 1000 questions on our website in our integrated in our LMS. And uh, you can take you make use of that. And after the examination, we have the significant number of courses which will help you earn PDOs. So Edureka will be there with you right from the beginning and it's not and it's basically an ongoing relationship that we have. So that's about the ideal preparation time and the high level steps that you need to take up. And uh, important point is when you take this training through PR, through Edureka, you're going to get 24 by seven assistance from Edureka. 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You can log in a ticket, you can talk to the support team here and within a stipulated time frame, your query will be answered or your issues will be resolved. And let me look at this question. And uh, Stephanie is asking, I have worked on several small projects at the same time while working as a assistant project manager. It would be impossible to list all of the projects I worked on the application. How will it will I be able to document PM experience? Uh, Stephanie, PMI has not put any restriction of the number of projects that you have to handle. You might have worked on hundreds of projects and the objective is to document 4,500 hours of project management experience. Okay. Uh, suppose the duration of the project that you have worked on is very small two days, three days or four days or five days. Then of course there would be multiple number of projects uh, that you need to document there. But if that is a case, you actually do not have any option. You will have to go by that way only. Okay. And that's why I'm telling you PMI has not put any restriction because sometime the kind of industry where you work in the kind of work you do, the duration of the project may not be very long. Not necessary. You will have projects coming with the duration of three months or four months or five months, but you can go ahead and document that. What I can do is what I can help you with is after this session, uh, you can get in touch with me and uh, I will provide you an Excel template where you can fill up some of the information, information about some of the project that you handled, and I'll guide you how to do that. And in case if needed, I'll make some corrections also there for you. Okay. So I hope your, uh, your query is answered here. If you have any doubt, um, I'm there for another five and a half hours and after that as well. Okay. So this is about your ideal preparation time for the PMP exam. And with this, uh, we move to the next one. I already mentioned that, you know, how Edureka is going to help you and are uh, attaining that PMP credential and also in maintaining that. Adureka has live and interactive online classes. We have all these instructor led uh, virtual classes, online classes, and uh, we have different, different schedule. Like some of the people would like to prefer, would prefer a continuous four day session. So we have four day session. We have two weekend batch and we have eight week, four weekend batch as well, where each session is a four hours. So in case if you are working on a very critical project, you are not able to pull out, uh, you know, all 35 hours, 36 hours in one go, you can split that. In case if you miss any of the session for any reason, you can actually uh, attend any of the future batch and that too without any additional cost. It's it's going to be uh, completely free. You can re-attend the class in case if some of the topics were not clear or uh, you appeared for the examination sometime back and uh, unfortunately the time between your uh, you know training and the examination has increased from six to eight weeks to let's say one year or two year. After one year, if you come back, you can attend any of the batch which is on go going on at that time for that particular topic without any ex extra charges. And uh, the biggest advantage of attending an online session is you get access to the recorded session throughout your life. It's not where it doesn't come with any validity. So once you do this, once you attend the training, 
throughout your life you can access this recording anytime that you want through your learning management system and you have uh, you get around 1000 mock questions and module wise quiz on the on our website on the lms 24 by 7 technical support post course support and also assistance in filling up the application form okay so with this uh, you know we have covered our first topic which was introduction uh, sorry introduction to the 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 prerequisites and the formalities of the pmp examination and talking about the myths and how it works for the pmp so the next topic is introduction to project and project management we will start with the very basics and then we are going to get into some uh, the the level the depth at which we are going to work and we are going to discuss the things is going to decrease so we will uh, have a overview we will have a high level view of it but uh, for that high level it's important we understand the basics here so the project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product service or result this is the definition of project as given in pembok guide fifth edition it this this definition actually highlights the three un, the characteristics of a project first is it has to be temporary second is unique and third is a progressive elaboration elaboration temporary means it has to start one day and it has to end one day it cannot be an ongoing effort if it is an ongoing effort then it is no longer a project but it becomes an operations and for operation you cannot use your project management approach or project management methodology you need to have methodology or the operations management uh, procedure there so this is one characteristic which will differentiate it from the operations a lot of people come with this uh, question that you know i work in the operations i work in the finance domain i work in let's say bank and all i'm doing some day to day activities does it makes me eligible for the pmp examination now the question is uh, or the, the point that i tell them is along with your regular operational work you might have worked on certain projects as well for example if you are working in the finance operation along with your operational goals and operational activity if you have worked on any of the process improvement any of the quality goal any of the quality objective if you worked on any six sigma or uh, uh, green belt or black belt project if you worked on an initiative which was to bring down the operational cost okay that also can fall into the uh, boundaries of project management because you started that activity with a specific goal it gave you a unique output let's say you received a goal an objective from your management team that bring down the opex or operational cost by 20% okay so the outcome of that entire cost optimization project is going to be 20% reduction in your opex which is a unique output and it of course is going to be time bound it will start one day and it will end one day so it becomes a temporary endeavor and also most importantly it has progressive elaboration so progressive elaboration is as you move ahead let me go to the paint so i can draw it there and i can explain it to you so as you move ahead you will see that the scope will increase the the uh, number of activities that you're doing are increasing and uh, you get more clarity on what is to be done you get more clarity on the scope you get to move towards the final details of the project okay so that that makes it that is called as progressive elaboration okay uh, just a feedback i received that it was too long on how to apply for the examination i understand i understand but uh, you know that was the uh, one of the topic where people actually have a lot of questions and a lot of doubt and a lot of uh, you know uh, misconceptions as well i am so sorry i apologize if you feel it was too long uh, because some of the people in uh, my previous session they mentioned that it is actually we they need more detail about the prerequisite but uh, later on when you get the recording you want to refresh anything you can of course skip that part but for the future sessions we will definitely take in your point and we will consider that thanks for the feedback any 
so we were talking about this progressive elaboration so this is uh, the you know as you move ahead in the project you get clarity about what is to be delivered you get clarity on uh, the final details of the project and that is your project so once you have a project ready once you have identified a project then you need to start managing the project and for that we will use project management which is the application of knowledge skills tools and techniques applied to the project activities to meet the project requirements so this definition is very important here uh, it says the application of knowledge the knowledge if i ask you what is the knowledge so this knowledge is generally from the PM, pmi perspective it's not about the domain if you are working in programming if you do the coding not necessary you need to be a master of coding if you work in construction not necessary that you have to be a person who has who has done work in all aspect of the construction but when we talk about the knowledge we are actually emphasizing on the project management knowledge the knowledge of the processes you need to use to manage that project okay talking about skills so your managerial skills your communication skills your soft skills and these skills are very very crucial because as a project manager you need to manage the project and managing the project means managing the information or the work which is being done in the project and for that you need to interact with the people your team member you have your customer you have your senior management running after your life because they want more to be done in less time they want all the information as of yesterday your team is of course they have their own challenges so these are all the stakeholders and as a project manager it is your responsibility to manage the expectations of the stakeholder and to manage the expectations of the different stakeholders you need to have certain skills okay so those are the skills which are very very important and in fifth edition of the pmp book guide pmi also has put lot of emphasis on the competencies of the project manager okay. along with this a pm must be loaded with the tools and techniques so tools are not just any spreadsheet in your excel the tools are the different activities also that you you might do you will be loaded or overloaded with the information you need to use certain tools to be able to capture that information to be able to uh, to, to create the repository of the information and also to process that information and apply certain techniques so that you can use that information in your decision making okay for example if you are my boss i am sitting on my desk and working and you come to me and ask me nishant how much of the work is done and if if i if i tell you 50% of the work is done does it makes any sense to you no you need to know because you need to know 50% in what in uh, how much time how much of the work was supposed to be done by now and how much we have done we need we should be able to do a comparison isn't it so 50% work done in isolation does not makes any sense so the correct way of telling this is by this time we were supposed to complete 45% of the work and i have completed 50% of the work so whatever information you are getting from the different tools you must apply you must interpret that information in a useful information that that's a data and you need to translate into information and this to on top of everything a project manager must also have some generic management skills and also the professional ethics so pmi puts lot of emphasis on the ethical part of it so in the earlier versions of pmbok like until pmbok guide the third edition there was a separate knowledge area on professional responsibility and ethics but from fourth edition onwards they removed that knowledge area and integrated or added that to uh, all the other knowledge areas that we have okay once your you have identified the project and you have started using your project management then you need to understand that where exactly you are going to apply this knowledge skills and tools and techniques and that is to 
ensure that all the competing factors of the project or the constraints of the project are in control. Okay, it's very very important. It's very important to understand it's uh, that where we are going to apply that, what are the different constraints that we have, and how we are going to manage those constraints. Okay, and it is the responsibility and duty of the project manager to balance and balance among these constraints. And those constraints are your scope, time, cost, quality, resources, risk. One of the element gets disturbed or changes it is going to impact your entire project for example if there is a minor change or deviation in scope it is definitely going to increase your budget it is definitely going to increase the time your schedule it may impact the quality you may need some additional resources and it may increase the risk you make some changes to the schedule suppose you have a time overrun your project got delayed then of course your scope might get impacted your cost will definitely get a hit quality may get impacted resources may get impacted risk may get impacted so as a project manager you always have to you have to ensure always that you are always getting you are getting a perfect triangle among your scope time cost which is the key constraints of a project but easier said than done it's very easy to speak about those constraints and talk about this constraint that we need to manage this we need to manage that when it comes to real life situation that is where your all your knowledge and skills and capabilities are checked and tested and project manager need to rely on certain tools and techniques and processes and also methodology Okay. to have a good control on your project first of all you must understand the life cycle of the project you need to have a very good visibility on the life cycle now when we talk about the life cycle we get two uh, uh, different terms for that project life cycle or product life cycle what is a project life cycle and what is a product life cycle product life cycle is a superset let me draw that here and i hope my drawing skills will improve with time okay so this is your uh, starting of the program let's say okay for example you work with a car manufacturing company okay and uh, your management team has decided that we are going to come up with a future car and you being a head of the R&D department you have been asked to prepare a prototype with some state of the art, art feature okay. so you set up a team you finalize a project and you start working on that project and for that project you actually you know identify certain phases or certain stages of that let's say your R&D uh, let me just type it here okay your uh, analysis feasibility analysis and then after some time you may want to do your uh, design once you have identified that yes it is feasible you do the design then you will probably build the car and then you will do the testing of that and then it will go for final approval okay once it is approved then you that prototype will go into manufacturing so the outcome of this project will lead into operations and then you may have to do some operational activities there uh, you will have to do start manufacturing that it goes to the shop floor when it goes to the shop floor you follow the operations because then it's uh, just uh, doing the mass production of the car so let's say on the first year your company decides to manufacture 5000 units of that car second year they decide to increase the capacity and the production and they say we will manufacture 10000 cars third years because third year because the demand of the car me go very high company says okay we will manufacture 15000 car and after that 
the company says we may want to scale down the production because at some point of time you need to phase out this car and come up with a new variant of that okay so you will you can see here that two parallel activities are going on here one is your operational activities okay and second will be your project activities how come project car gets into the picture here so here let me just write it down to make it clear operations manufacturing operations and then you may have some project as well now how come project also gets project gets into the picture here so the first year in the first year the capacity of that plant was to produce 5000 unit and next year the company decided to increase the production capacity or, or to double up the production capacity for that enhancement you need to do certain activities certain work which is time bound which will have some unique output and it also will have some progressive elaboration okay so that is a project upgrading your your manufacturing plant enhancing your skills enhancing your manufacturing capabilities will be a part of project uh, will be a will be will fall into the guidelines of the project boundaries of the project operational activities will continue to work there let's say in the second year company decides that okay so far we have been importing 90% of the components of this car from some other country and in the second year they decide to manufacture almost 50% of the components in house for that the company again need to set up certain projects uh that is designing of those components or maybe manufacturing of those components so you can see operations and projects are going hand in hand at that area okay and after some point of time company decides to uh, sunset this car they said okay we are not going to manufacture any any future further models but we will continue to provide support to the people who have purchased this car so when we talk about the product life cycle the product life cycle is right from the second let me just uh, get hold of this production the prod life cycle of the product which is your car started probably some early stage even before that because your company might have taken a decision based on the report or analysis that they did in terms of the market visibility and the requirement so from that point till the time the car is being manufactured or is being supported and until the time it is marked as end of life so that from this point from this point to this point it is your product life cycle now within this product life cycle within this span of time there were multiple projects might have been multiple projects so let's say coming up with the prototype of the car was a project okay upgrading your organization uh, your uh, manufacturing plant or setting up the manuf manufacturing plant was a project cost optimization or automation can be a project in between increasing your capacity can be a project in this so product life cycle is a superset and there may be multiple project life cycle or operational life cycle within that product life cycle okay so it's very very important for you to understand the difference between your product life cycle and the project life cycle an outcome of a project may lead into operations and it may actually kick start another project there but that all will be a part of your parent which is a product life cycle okay so uh, i hope uh, this part is clear to everyone if you have any questions please feel free to type in your questions and i will be glad and happy to answer those questions okay. when we talk about the project life cycle project life cycle is let's say i told you that this one is a project this from this point to this time is a project and from the starting point till the end point this project underwent uh, went through various stages okay for example we human being we are born and then we are kid we grow up we get into teenage then we young then we start going towards the midlife and then we age and then we then end of life which is a universal fact and a fundamental truth okay 
okay we also go through the different stages of life similar way a project also has to go through the different stages of life which is called as life cycle so life cycle is made up of multiple phases and those phases can be subjective that that phases may differ the name of the phase may differ from the industry to industry or the or, or the type of project that you are doing so you know in a construction you may have these kind of phases your feasibility planning and design production in pharma you may have the discovery and screening of the uh, any medicine pre clinical development registration workup post submission activities in it it's it's completely different it's gathering analysis design development testing and all but these are the phases which are which you need to identify in your project you must define the life cycle of your project because once you have identified the life cycle based on that you can decide what level of control you are going to exercise what will mark completion of one phase and you can move ahead in the project so talking about the phases more detailed into the phases these phases will be interrelated interconnected they will definitely have some relationship among them that relationship can be sequential it can be overlapping or it can be iterative as well okay when we talk about a traditional uh, waterfall approach we use sequential or we sometimes use overlapping as well when we talk about agile it it is always iterative okay you plan one phase and based on the outcome of that Uh, one phase you decide what should be the next phase or what will be the deliverables of the activities in the of the next phase okay so project phase is something very important to understand because uh, there may not be any direct question for it but it will help you take some or you know it will help you understand some of the complex questions in the pmp examination now let us talk about the factors in phasing the projects so from this point uh, you need to you know uh, uh, we will go slightly to the higher level of course we have only 5 hours or 4 or 40 minutes 45 minutes left and we will not be able to cover everything so i'm just going to touch upon certain topics which you must understand from the examination perspective and I'm, uh, we're also going to talk about the practical uh, implications of that so uh, first of all you must understand the the influence that your organization may have on the project when you start preparing for the pmp examination when you read the through the pmbok which i am going to take you through uh, you will see there are processes and each process has some inputs and in most uh, actually in all of the planning processes one of the key input is opa that is your organizational process assets okay along with that you will have some enterprise environmental factor and there is one more thing which is not there in any process but which is superficial across all the projects in the organization and that is a the your culture your organizational culture and the style each organization depending on the country they work in depending on the industry or irrespective of all those factors they have certain culture and those that culture has a major and significant influence on the project that are being run in that organization you must understand what kind of system you have what kind of pmi is uh, project management system information system you are using you must understand what are the style that organization follow what kind of policies and procedures you have what is what are the ethics and workers and the organizational structure and the shared value belief and expectations so from the entire set of uh, factors which can have an influence on the project we will talk about the organizational structure organization structure is important from the examination point of view because there would be minimum you can expect minimum 2 to 3 questions only from this topic that is organizational structure and in the real life as well it becomes very important why let me explain you that for example you are working on a project and uh you require for your project work for your decision making you require some report from the quality analyst irrespective of the industry or the uh, function you work in i am saying you are a project manager managing a project and in your plan of activities you had one activity that you know you need to do a uh, analysis of the quality or 
some other areas. You reach out to your quality analyst asking him for a report that I needed as for the schedule you're supposed to give it to me today. So I want to see it by end of the day and he responds you back saying I am sorry I am tied up with some other work which my boss has given to me. I will not be able to finish it uh, before next week. And you have no option but to rely on or, or to like you know uh, accept this or at the, so at the most what you can do is you can escalate this you can go to his manager or her manager and you can discuss things with them. But whatever you do this has impacted your schedule. You will not be able to complete or finish your work on time. Now think about it why it has happened because the person who is supposed to give you that report is not under your direct control. It means as a project manager your authority over the project resources is limited. Isn't it? And that is because the type of organization you work into has not given you full authority or control over the project resources. Now there is nothing right or wrong in that. You cannot say no this is wrong. I want full power, full authority. I am the project manager. But you will not decide what kind of power or authority you are going to get. That is decided by the type of structure your organization follows. Depending on the industry, depending on the work that your company does, depending on the uh, certain other factors, it is decided that what structure they are going to follow and this decision is taken at a very high level leadership level at the time of forming the organization also they might have decided. So there are three high level or broad categories of the organizational types. Your projectized organization, matrix organization and functional organization. Within matrix organization there are three subcategories strong matrix, balanced matrix and weak matrix. Each of the organization type decides or defines that how much authority project manager has over the project and the project resources. How much control project manager has over all the resources and the work that is being done. So before you start your project, before you start planning for the project, before you finalize the resources or the schedule, you must have a very clear visibility on what all resources are working or reporting directly to you. Do you have an authority to decide when they should do this project work, when they should not do this project work or you don't have that. If you do not have that authority and control over the resources, find out who controls those resources. Okay. Because in that case if you do not have that control of the resources your authority is limited so it means you need to you don't work in a system where project manager has all the power. So looking at this uh, uh, picture which is on the right side of the screen you can see depending on the type of organization the authority of the project manager is increasing or decreasing. Projectized organization, project manager will be completely empowered and he will have full 100% authority to take any decision about the project. All the resources will be under his control or her control directly. Functional manager will have no authority in the projectized organization. Okay. But when you talk about the functional organization, the authority or the decision making power for the project will be with the functional manager. So the similar example that I gave you, a quality analyst who has refused to do the work that you gave him today, he's saying that if you want this to be done, you need to talk to my manager. And that manager, quality manager is actually a functional manager. If you go to product organization, most of the time in the product organization, you will see organizations are projectized. Project manager has all the power and authority who is working in his team, who is not working, when they are going to work, when they will do certain things. Okay, and he all the resources will report directly to the project manager. But if you go to the services or if you go to the manufacturing organization, there it, it, it's uh, most likely it is going to be a functional manager or the authority will be with functional manager. For example, if you work in a manufacturing and you have a functional manager, you have operations manager, you have supply chain manager and you have your uh, 
फाइनेंस मैनेजर कंपनी लीडरशिप दे डिसाइड दैट ओके वी आर गोइंग टू ब्रिंक डाउन द ऑपरेशनल कॉस्ट बैट ट्वेंटी परसेंट इन लेट से वन क्वार्टर और टू क्वार्टर एंड दे पास ऑन दिस इंफॉर्मेशन टू द सीनियर मैनेजमेंट टीम और टू द फंक्शन मैनेजर टीम so each of the functional manager will probably identify one resource or a group of resources from their their team who is going to work on the initiative to bring down the cost but and and if it is a cross functional player project then your supply chain will pull out one or two resources manufacturing will pull out two resources finance will pull out two resources and all six of them will be working on this project to bring down the cost one of them can be identified as a person uh, who will coordinate all the activities who will probably uh, you know collect all the data present it to the function manager now that person is actually doing a coordinator's role he will not or uh, that person will not have any power or any authority to take any any decision that authority lies with the function manager it means you are working in a weak matrix organization in the balance matrix the authority and the power of the project manager can be share will be shared okay the authority will be shared between your project manager and the function manager in a strong matrix project manager will have higher authority than the function manager and in the projectized organization he will be the complete owner of the project so this table shows you that uh, in a different type of organization structure what kind of authority project manager has what kind of control he has on that so you can see in the functional organization project manager's authority is actually none okay it may be very little or none in weak matrix it will move to limited balanced matrix from low to moderate strong matrix moderate to high and in projectized it is high to almost total okay so from the pmp examination perspective you must understand that how it is going to impact your project values in terms of planning in terms of execution in terms of resources availability okay in a real life it actually has a very greater very very important impact and significant impact on your project and i'm sure the example that i gave you must have experienced that at some point of time in your professional life so before you start a project in your organization you first identify how much power or authority you have you need to figure out what kind of organization you work into is it a projectized organization is it a matrix type of organization or a functional organization okay uh, i hope uh, is it is clear to everyone any questions you can just uh, type in your question in the chat window Okay thanks mike mm i will consider no news as a good news so more no more questions it means it is clear so let's move on to the next factor which is going to impact your uh, uh, which will have a influence on your project is a organizational process assets so opa i'll call it as an opa so opa is basically a collection of all your processes policies procedures and knowledge base when i say knowledge base it means all the projects that you have done in the past historical database documentation available from those that uh, 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 historical projects which you can use for this project for example you did a project which was delayed significantly and okay uh, this project was done in the organization by some other project manager and there was a significant amount of delay cost overrun in this project now why it happened that project must have documented some lessons learned so you need to figure out what went wrong in that project so that you can take some preventive actions for your project so the knowledge base becomes very important it will also have a repository of all the policies and procedures and processes when we talk about the processes so processes are related to the methodology that the organization follows and this methodology is owned by an entity in the organization so let me let me do a check here 
So can you please write the name of the entity which will own these processes, policies, procedure and the knowledge base? Just take a minute. Shrikant, yes, fantastic. Rory, Shrikant, you, fantastic. It's PMO, Project Management Office or some organization, they also call it as a Program Management Office. So your PMO will own your your processes, policies, guidelines. A simple example, you join a new organization, you don't know how things move and you have to kickstart a project. You go to your manager and your manager says, you please connect with this gentleman or this lady from this team and they will guide you. When you go and connect with that person, you get a whole list of documentation to be done, whole set of approvals that you require and you need to follow certain process. So that person is most likely to be a PMO, Project Management Office or Program Management Office. And these OPA will have a significant impact on your project as well. For example, your previous project or one of the previous project was delayed because you had to procure something from a vendor and the vendor delayed the delivery of that material. So the project was delayed. So when you are planning for the new project, you will ensure that you have already clarified from this vendor that, you know, no delay should happen or uh, uh, you know, why this delay happened or you may also want to look for another vendor. So there is a question from Mike, which OPAs are owned by the PMO, not all OPAs, correct? Yes, yes, Mike, you're absolutely correct. Not everything or not 100% of the OPA will be owned by the PMO. I am talking about the key processes. For example, your methodology. Methodology says the moment you have to start a project, first of all, you need to fill up a charter document. So who is going to give you the charter document or the template for the charter is your PMO. Okay. There is a policy. So policy is not owned by the PMO, but PMO ensures that you are adhering to the policy. Policies are decided at the organization level. Okay. Management has decided that, okay, the policy is all the people are not supposed to spend more than nine hours in the office. Some of the countries have very specific labor laws and they want to abide by the laws. So the management has taken, has made a policy that no one is allowed to work for more than nine hours in office. So PMO will ensure that the project hours that are being documented are in accordance with the policy. Okay. I hope I was able to make it clear, Mike. Okay. Thank you. And uh, then there may be some practices or knowledge, uh, some artifacts which can be used, to, which will have a significant influence on the project and your, uh, your completed schedule. We talked about that, your risk data, you know, your organization may have a checklist uh, depending on the industry you work on. For example, uh, let's take an example of NASA. If NASA has to send a manned mission on moon or in space, there is a very, very, rigid risk management process which they need to follow okay so project manager we need to work with the compliance team i'm not sure i'm not familiar with the the modus operandi of nasa but of course there is a compliance team there will be a compliance team who will own that risk data and who will ensure that you are following this checklist you are following the correct steps to minimize the likelihood or probability of that risk Okay. And uh, as I told you, when we go to the process level, you will see that OPAs are an input to the most of the planning, actually not most, uh, uh, you can say all of the planning processes, because none of the planning can be done without referring to your OPA. Okay. So two high level categories for OPA is your process and procedures and your corporate knowledge base. When we talk about uh, execution or monitoring and trolling, some of the processes you will see updates to OPA as an element, as an item there. Updates to OPA it means you are updating that data, the actual data in your knowledge base. Okay? You are archiving that information. Clear? So this is about OPA and another important point that you must know 
about is here. Okay, so this is a, a visual depiction of your OPA or the corporate knowledge base. And the next point that we are going to talk about is your enterprise environmental factors. Enterprise environmental factors are again uh, significantly important. You know, they they are again uh, input to the most of the processes, and they may include your culture, your structure, and the governance. For example, uh, the same NASA. So NASA has a very very stringent process, and they say that every component or every item that you are procuring from the vendor, from a third party vendor, must go through a rigorous check, a process of check. So PMO is going to own that process, okay? But that governance that you must have is based on the uh, is decided by the organization as a senior management team. So as an organization, they need to have that strict governance in place. Okay. We talked about uh, nine hours policy, that uh, the policy is uh, that people should not be allowed to work more than nine hours, let's say eight hours, let's reduce it further. So that eight hours is decided by the management team considering the local law, law of the land, law of the country. So that becomes an enterprise environmental factor. Okay, your market condition. If uh, you have to submit a proposal for the new project and you're saying the return on investment or the margin of profit in this project is going to be 20%. So your board or your senior management will take a decision based on the guidelines of the organization and the guidelines of the organization may say we will not undertake any project where margin of the profit is less than 25%. So your project may die at the charter stage only. Why? Because it did not comply with one of the enterprise environmental factor. And what was that factor? That was a factor which was in accordance with your market condition or your organizational, your, your governance or certain specific policies. Clear? So enterprise environmental factor will be there wherever you see a planning process, EEF will definitely be there. In certain cases, when you go to the some processes of project HR management, you will see that uh, uh, in, in two processes, you will see updates to enterprise environmental factor. So updates to enterprise environmental factor will happen when, when there are some changes need to be made in specific, uh, uh, you know, policies or the guidelines of the organization. For, for example, you know, company may have a strict guideline that everyone need to work from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. Now this project that you're working on requires a team member to interact with a with a with a customer which is in a completely different time zone. So the people, a lot of people are working in the night and they are in the call with the customer till probably 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or they need to interact with them. So for them it will not be possible to join the work at report for the work at 8 o'clock. So for those cases, there may be an output that updates to your enterprise environmental factor. Okay. So whenever you see this is an output to your processes, uh, you will see that only in two processes, you know what they are looking at. So with this, uh, we actually cover uh, the three elements here. And another important point that you must consider is the project stakeholder. This is a point which a lot of people I have seen in my experience, they miss. They fail to identify how stakeholders can impact their project. And that's why sometimes the project goes for a toss. So let us understand who is a stakeholder and who is not. Your project, any person, any individual or a group of individuals or organization who is actively involved in the project or who has the power to influence the project or may get influenced by the outcome of the project directly is a stakeholder. Your senior management is a stakeholder. Your project team is a stakeholder. Your vendor is a stakeholder. Okay. So these are all the people who can influence your project or who can get influenced by the outcome of your project. 
So let me ask you a question. You can write the answer of that in the chat window. I have a competitor. Shall I treat that as a stakeholder? Just say yes or no in the chat window. Can my competitor be a stakeholder? Okay, great. I can see most of the answers are no. Yes. It in a standard project, it may not be a stakeholder. In PMP examination, you may get a question like that. But again, there is some amount of subjectivity involved into that. If I look at as per the general in the general perspective, my competitor is not a stakeholder. Okay, but in certain cases, in certain specific projects, it can be. Let's say you are working on a government project and it's a huge project. So government decided to split that project into different, different pieces and they assigned this project to three different com companies. Yours is one of them and all these three are actually competitors. So technically that organization, other organization is a competitor. But at the same time, in your project, it can be a stakeholder as well. So remember, whenever you have to answer this kind of question in the PMP examination, read the question thoroughly. And sometimes you may have to read between the lines as well. Okay, so from the PMP examination perspective, there may be some amount of subjectivity involved into that. In the general perspective, my competitor is not a stakeholder. Okay. Your key stakeholder may include your PMO, customer, user, your seller, vendor, ops, or any person with whom you have some touch points in the project. And why I say that your stakeholder can influence your project is, let's say there is a, a um, compliance manager. Or uh, let me give you an example of quality manager. Okay. So you work in a matrix organization, balanced matrix organization, where you share your responsibility or the project or the responsibility and the power is shared by the project manager and the functional manager. Quality manager is one of the functional manager. And one of the deliverable or your project is not complying with the company policy. It is well within the margin, okay, but still quality manager says, no, I cannot give this approval to this project. I cannot pass this project. So that deliverable will be, you will, you may have to do some rework. It means what? It means that person has a power and authority to influence your project. And because he has now said, no, you cannot move ahead and your project is getting a hit in terms of time, in terms of definitely cost as well. It means what? That you as a project manager missed identifying the influence of that person earlier and you did not uh, factor in to what extent it can influence or it can impact your project. If you had identified that this person is a major stakeholder and if we do not comply to these and these standards, he will not approve the deliverable and without approval, we will not be able to move ahead. Then you probably would have taken some actions and steps while the work is being done or while the work was being planned that to end that, you know, what the output must be within these parameters or within these guidelines. Okay. So that's why your, your stakeholder identification is very important. I'll give you another very quick example. When you started your project, Everything was fine. Everything was hunky dory. You started working on the project and you are at the final stage of the project where you have done your, uh, your deliverables are all ready and you're ready to hand over them to the customer. And at that time you come to know from your management or from your leadership team or from your PMO that you must get an approval from your compliance manager. And when you go to the compliance manager in a Jiffy in an unplanned way, that person says, I am sorry, I cannot give you approval until and unless you do these activities, give me the audit report. So now your project is getting a hit. Another example could be, okay, another example could be, uh, 
your uh, your uh, let's say you know senior vice president of the customer organization he is a very senior person and he said that he is going to review the project on a quarterly basis only and uh, during one of the review certain factors he did not like and he is saying no i am not happy unless you clarify that we cannot move ahead okay so unless those points are clarified you cannot move to the next stage of the project and in that situation you will have to probably go back and you'll have to do some corrections you'll have to do some additional work if you have identified that stakeholders in the early stage and if you had noted down the expectation of that stakeholder in the early stage it would have helped you plan or consider or include those factors or the additional work in your schedule as well so there is a question here okay so compliance manager in your okay mike has a question so compliance manager in this example will be a stakeholder compliance manager is just following the enterprise environmental factor okay he is following a guideline which is set by the organization and there is another question by uh, lien uh, please uh, let me know if i am uh, pronouncing it correctly or not so please explain the rotate log file so rotate log file is basically your your person you know who is responsible to manage the log files probably you know the your documentation or your archival requirements that person can also be a stakeholder so let me take it to the say link it with the compliance only one of the guideline or enterprise your environmental factor is that all the work all the reports which are being generated audit reports project performance report must be documented in your document management system and you completed your project you followed everything but you failed to archive that in or put that into your repository so your log files might be missing from there and when it comes to the compliance manager for the final approval he will check whether these files are there or not the person has maintained that documentation or not it may uh, uh, if it is not there if it is not complying with that he may reject it okay so these are just a example the list is not limited to this there can be many more people or stakeholders beyond this as well so with this we move to the next topic that is your understanding the processes and the project management framework so please let me know if you have any questions from the previous topic that we covered and uh, there is a question from stephanie how can the customer be a project stakeholder isn't the project finished by the time the customer receives the product deliverable your customer is a major stakeholder okay you are working on a project and let's say it's a 6 months project and customer has asked for a review every 15 days or every month now customer is a stakeholder because he is the one who is going to get impacted by the outcome of this project and he is the one who can actually impact your project or influence your project significantly or in a big way so you must consider you must note down the expectations of the stake customer you must note down the expectation of all the stakeholder you must validate those expectations whether they are right they are justified or not and accordingly you should make the plan accordingly you should identify the deliverables or the project specifics so that those expectations can be met on time what happens otherwise what will happen is you started working on the project you have the first customer review meeting and during that review meeting customer is not happy because he has some different set of expectation so customer will say i am sorry i cannot give you a go ahead on this i am sorry i cannot release any additional fund for that so he becomes a major stakeholder another question is uh, oh, oh sorry stephanie i hope i was able to answer the question you can just uh, confirm that in the chat window otherwise i'll take it to the further detail okay so rory has a question is the pmo responsible for identifying the stakeholders in the organization pmo can give you a standard list but it is a project manager who will have to define who will have to identify see normally this work is done this is a team effort it's a team work you know 
team member, it is the responsibility of the project team to identify the stakeholder. And PMO, based on the policies, there would be some people who are fixed stakeholder, who is a permanent stakeholder in all the project that you do in the organization. Let's say compliance. Because of the policy that is there in the organization, every project must obtain an approval from the compliance manager. Then yes, your compliance manager will be a stakeholder. PMO will ensure that you are filling up the right document, you have the right templates available, and PMO is also will also ensure that you are obtaining the approval from the compliance manager. Okay, so it is the responsibility of the project manager and the project team to identify the stakeholder. There may be some stakeholders which will be subjective depending on the project. There may be some stakeholders which have to be a permanent stakeholder or a, uh, a must stakeholder in all the project and that is given by the PMO. But all those subjectivity is designed, defined by the team itself. So I hope your question is answered Rory. Okay, great. Thank you. So we can move to the next topic which is your process and project management framework. And uh, this is the place where we will talk about the PMBOK guide. So let me give you some introduction of PMBOK guide. So PMBOK guide, PMBOK stands for Project Management Body of Knowledge. PMI started, uh, PMI came up with a standard framework or you can say the collection of the best practices sometime in early 90s. And from that time, they started releasing the updates to it every uh, three years. So the latest edition of this PMBOK guide is fifth edition. As I told you, they gave you the update and the refresh it, refresh the, come up with the updated version of this every three years. So the next version, which is the sixth edition of PMBOK, is going to be released on 1st January 2016. So these time and dates are for fixed for uh, you know um, all across 1st January 2016 6th edition will be out and people who have taken this training uh, on the 5th edition of the PMBOK guide they for them the cutoff date for the PMP examination is 31st July so they will have opportunity to take the examination based on 5th edition till 31st July PMI is going to change the basis of their exam from 1st August. 1st August 2016 will be the cutover date for the latest edition for the of, of the PMBOK guide. So PMBOK guide is a collection of the not uh, PMBOK is a collection of the best practices which are submitted and documented by the professionals from all the nooks and corners of the world from all the industries. Okay. And PMBOK guide that we have is basically a distilled version of the wider body of knowledge. And this PMBOK guide is divided into three sections. One is your project management framework that we already talked about your organizational influence in the project life cycle. And uh, then we have process groups and your uh, processes in the process groups. So there are five process groups, which is your initiating, planning, ex executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing, and processes. There are 47 processes in PMBOK guide. Fifth edition of PMBOK guide has 47 processes. In, in the fourth edition, there were 42 processes. They added five new processes in this edition, and there, are, there may be certain changes in the next edition of that. But as of now, for you, 47 processes and then there are 10 knowledge areas as well distinct knowledge distinctive knowledge areas that is your project integration scope time cost quality and so on we are going to go through that we are going to have a look at those processes and those knowledge areas as well so this part we have already covered pm framework we already covered a very high level view of that we will quickly review the process group and process group interaction and I will show you the PMBOK guide which will uh, where you will get a glimpse of all the 47 processes mapped to all these 10 knowledge areas. 
okay now from the examination point of view you must go through you must be familiar with all the process groups all the processes all the knowledge areas and the mapping of these 47 processes with the process group and the knowledge areas how we are going to do that i'll show that to you in some time so let us first of all understand what is a process okay i hope everyone knows what is a process because process is something that we keep on listening keep on hearing day in and day out for example you have just completed a travel and you came back from the travel and now is the time to claim the expenses or uh, uh, submit the expenses for the reimbursement so does it happen like this that you go to your accounts department you go to a accounts officer give him all the bills and you ask okay i spent 200 dollars please pay me 200 dollars cash he will say no i cannot pay you like that so what you do is you take this form fill that up attach all the original receipts and pick that into a drop box and we, every day morning 10 o'clock we are going to open that box and we'll collect all the form and then i'm going to check whether all the original receipts are attached or not then i'm going to give it to the senior person senior account officer who will check whether the spend was well within limit or not are you eligible for that or not once it is all approved then it will go to probably the accounts manager who will approve it or reject it if it is approved then your company is going to or your finance department accounts department is going to deposit the money not on the random fashion but maybe they will have their own life cycle some companies follow that okay twice a month they will release a payment some companies will release a payment on the weekly basis so once the expenses are approved then in the next cycle you are going to get the receive the money reimbursement so what is this this is a process this is a predefined and a pre-identified set of actions and activities to complete that work so for each and every element of the project important element pimbok has processes one of the mistake that people make most of the people make it they call this pimbok guide as a methodology no pimbok guide is not a methodology pimbok guide is a collection of processes and knowledge areas and you can make you can build your own methodology by choosing what processes are relevant and what are not okay so depending on the type of work you are doing depending on the guidelines of the organization you can pick and choose the processes build your uh, your uh, methodology and follow that process from the pm pmp examination perspective you must be very well aware of all these processes you have to become a champion of these processes you must understand where these processes are used in what form they are used okay see one of the advice and suggestion that i gave to all the people who attend my workshop who attend my session or with whom i interact is if you really want to grow in the project management you must move away from being a checklist project manager so when we talk about methodology you definitely will have the checklist but the processes you must use your wisdom your knowledge that how and where you're going to use these processes and pmi is going to check your that component okay whether you understand the processes you understand the application of that process or not and that is why i told you in the beginning this exam has actually become a sort of psychometric assessment where pmi is going to check how comfortable you are in solving those complex situations okay so there are two different uh, groups where your processes will fall first is you know uh, what is the the process that you need to follow or that is aligned with the Uh, organizing the work of the project or the project sometimes uh, okay uh, and uh, uh, let me give an example to understand this the work of the project so there is something called as project scope and there is something called as product scope okay so project scope is what is to be done product scope is how to be done suppose you 
have received a project, your company has received a project that they need to construct a gas station. So you need to construct the gas, gas uh, construct a gas station, and when you look at the guidelines, one of the most important guidelines is there must be some fire safety mechanism. There has to be fire extinguisher or some system installed in place. So that becomes the scope of the product. Okay. Now to have that product installed or to have that feature enabled in your in your product, you need to do certain activities that work that you're going to do will become your project scope. So to identify the work that you need to do for a project, you must define certain processes which will be your project management processes. And to identify what is to be delivered, to identify what are the specific features of the product, you must follow certain processes. Okay, Those processes can be like you're doing a prototype okay. so for that prototype there may be certain specific technical process which you need to follow which may be outside this list of 47 processes okay. so there is a comment from Mike uh, memorize table 3 1 yes I am going to show you that in some time that is something that you must must memorize I'll show you that in few minutes from now okay. So understand the difference and when you go for the project scope management, of course, we are not going to cover that in this uh, webinar session. That is a part of the detailed PMP exam preparation workshop session where we, we, we discuss about the product scope and project scope. So a process is made up of certain input. So that process will receive some information. That process is going to analyze and review that information using some tool and technique and that process is giving you the output output of one process can be or may be an input to one or multiple or more than one processes so now is the time to look at these processes here so i will show you this table please let me know if you see if you can see my desktop and you can see this pdf which i'm sharing right now so i am sharing the pimbo guide can you just confirm if you're able to see my screen, PIMBO guide on my screen? Okay, great. So this is a table 3-1 which Mike was talking about and it gives you a list of all the 47 processes and how they are mapped to the process groups and knowledge areas. So what you see here on the top, hold on, let me just show you that. Okay, what you see here on the top, this one is your, are all your process groups and what you see here from four to onwards are your knowledge areas and then these are the processes. I'm going to explain this in detail in a while but these are the processes and you need to memorize, memorize in the sense you must, must have a very, very good understanding of this table. I will not use the word memorize because I am absolutely against memorizing anything or everything. You must understand the logical flow. So we are going to spend a lot of time on this table here. So I'll go back to my screen, my presentation. So all these 47 processes, they, lot of the process, lot of these processes are interconnected. Output of one of the process, one process will be input to one or more than one processes and so on. Okay. I'll show you that mapping as well. For example, if you go to this process of any particular, I picked up any particular process here. You can see the process we are talking about in, uh, in highlight right now is develop project charter. Develop project charter is receiving input from these documents and these activities. And the output of this process is going into, is being used into so many processes. It is going to your develop project management plan. It is also uh, being used as an input in all these processes that you see on this side. Okay. So these processes are interconnected, they have some interdependency and interrelationship and you must understand that. So people who think that memorization will help, just remember there are 47 processes and each of the process has a this data flow diagram. 
Okay. Unless you have some super computer, super memory chip uh, integrated in your mind, it will not be possible to create that map. And for that, we must understand the logical flow of that. Okay. And that logical flow is something that we are going to talk about in a while from now. So moving to the next topic. Okay, let me uh, check if uh, everyone is clear with what we have discussed so far. Anyone has any question, please let me know. Okay, I will consider no news as a good news. So the next is your process group interaction. So we talked about the process groups. Uh, I call them as a IPEC. IPEC is your initiate, plan, initiate, plan, execute, control, and close. So these are the five process groups. And these process groups interact with each other in this order. You will initiate the project. You'll initiate the, uh, you know, you'll have to follow the processes which are in the initiating process group. And if I go to this table, which is on page number 61 of PIMBOK guide, I can see the table 3-1. Initiating process group has certain processes. Once you complete these processes, do all this required thing, then you will be able to start your planning process group. And the planning and execution may have some overlapping there. Of course, there is a lot of subjectivity involved depending on the nature of the work or the organization structure or the process that you follow. You will do that. And while the work is being done, you will have to use the processes which are in monitoring and controlling to ensure the work is as per plan. And also it is meeting the requirements and expectation of the stakeholder. And once you complete entire set of uh, uh, they complete the deliverables are completed, then you'll move on to the closing process process and you will exit the phase. Important point. Another point to understand here is these process groups. They are not the project life cycle. Okay, this process groups can be a part of your project management life cycle, which may be spread across the entire project or which may be limited to one phase of the project. Okay. For example, I'll get back to the screen. We said we talked about analysis, you know, so here we are saying analysis is a phase. Now, depending on the, the complexity, depending on the duration, depending on the location, geographical location, this analysis may take a long time. I was watching this documentary on the discovery channel about uh, how this, uh, uh, Panama Canal was built and constructed. So it took probably uh, probably uh, two or three years only to analyze whether it can be done there or not. Okay. So in these kind of complex project, your analysis itself can be a project in its own. Isn't it? So for that, you can actually define or you can have your different process groups or you can have it can have a project management life cycle within within it only. So in this case, in this example, what I gave you, what you do is you will have all these five process groups going on within the analysis. Then you may have the same process group going for design. You may have all this for build as well. But in a standard typical project, if you're an IT company, you have a duration of you have three month or four month long project or typical, very typical project, then you need not to have project management life cycle for each of the phase here, but you can define one single life cycle for the entire project life cycle. Okay. So these four phases, these process groups or different element of this process groups of this project management life cycle can be sequential, can be overlapping or can be iterative as well. Clear. And, uh, I'll jump back to the PMP examination blueprint from here. So a lot of people have this question that uh, which one is most critical, which one is most important here? Believe me, everything is important. Everything is, is very, very important in PMBOK. There is nothing of lower significance or lower importance. Okay. Uh, PMP examination, this 200, the distribution of the 200 questions will be like this for all the domains. 13% of the questions will be from initiation, 24 for planning, 30 for execution, 25 for monitoring and controlling, and 
eight percent of the questions will be from closing and they will be mixed randomly okay it's not that you will get a question so the first 13 percent questions will be from initiating next 24 percent will be for planning no they will be mixed randomly and you need to find out and figure out yourself that this question belong to that particular stage or process group or not somewhere this information may be useful somewhere it may not be okay i would suggest for the examination that if the question is such which does not demand you does not demand the identification of the process group do not waste your time to figure out it belongs to which domain look at the situation read it thoroughly understand the situation and take the answer select the option which is most appropriate as per the pmi guidelines so we're going to talk about the tips and tricks uh, towards the end of the session so stay on hang on till the time for for you know if you want to get answered of those questions okay now moving to the next part is these processes have their own structure they have certain set inputs tools and techniques and certain outputs pmi gives you a lot of flexibility and freedom okay so the project manager and project team can tailor the process customize the process modify the process okay they can merge two processes they can merge or remove some of the processes they can also uh, eliminate some of the elements of the process as well that is completely completely up to you as a project manager and your team okay from the examination perspective you will have to go through all those 47 processes but when it comes to the real time application you need to build your own methodology so you will use these 47 processes as a guiding document and based on that you're going to decide as a team whether this process certain processes are relevant or not if not don't include that in your methodology okay you can club certain processes for example validate scope and quality control can be merged your create wbs and define activity process can be merged your qualitative and quantitative risk analysis can be merged okay so these are just some of the examples that how you can do that in a real life pmi allows you to do that okay at this point of time i'll just deviate from uh, here for two minutes uh, i'm sure you all must have heard of uh, prince2 and agile Prince to follow a traditional protocol approach, which PMI also, which PMBOK also follows. In Prince to, you have set number of processes which you must follow in as is format. Okay. In PMI, in PMBOK guide, you have the liberty to pick and choose a process that you are going to follow in the real life. Okay. If you want to know more about the difference in PMI uh, in uh, PMI ECP Prince Two and PMP, you can uh, go to Edugrave website, and I did uh, a, a webinar uh, probably three weeks back that is named as Paths to PMP. You, it's a one-hour webinar, not so long uh, as long this this one is. Go through that webinar, and this will give you a complete. Uh, overview of or um, you know give you a complete clarity on what is the difference in acp prince 2 and pmp if you have any difficulties accessing that uh, webinar please reach out to the support team or reach out to me or the sales team and we will help you yeah. and uh, the next part is uh, project management knowledge areas so there are 10 knowledge areas 10 distinctive knowledge areas your integration scope time cost quality hr communication risk procurement and stakeholders same can be seen here as well in your pmbok guide so you have all these knowledge areas and each of the knowledge area has certain processes so depending on what stage of the project you are you will have to carry out these processes from each of the respective knowledge area okay so when you go for a four day or 35 hours training you actually are taken through all these 10 knowledge areas we do a deep dive into each and every process we review each and every input tools and techniques and outputs in that in that training here okay so you must be familiar with this mapping part and that's all about this chapter this topic 
and the next one is overview of the PMBOK guide. So that is where we do the 360 degree overview. So that's a slightly uh, lengthy and slightly uh, time taking topic. So before that, do you have any question that you want to ask right now? So I am sharing PMBOK right now and to get a complete view, I am going to minimize my question window on a side. So in case if I'm not, if I miss your question, uh, please bear with me. Another few minutes, I'm going to pop that uh, chat question window back. I need more space to do that. So let's go in the beginning of this PMBOK section. This is how your PMBOK guide is when you download the soft copy copy of it and when you come to this uh, index yeah table of content here you can see you have some introduction here and then it talks about from chapter 1 2 and 3 till chapter 1 2 and 3 they talk about the project management processes framework and also the factors which can influence your project that is your organizational framework your organizational structure and all area and also it talks about the competencies of the project manager which is very important so the knowledge area start from chapter 4 that's why when you go to this table on page number 61 you must be wondering that you know why it is starting from 4 why not from 1 because 1 is introduction 2 is your organization influence in the project life cycle 3 is your pm processes and the knowledge area start from 4 Okay, and uh, then they have all these 10 knowledge areas. I'm scrolling a bit fast because I need to go to the next section here. Okay. Here, yes. Towards the end, you see this, this NX1, which says standards for project management of a project, which is on page number 417. So when you go, uh, go through the processes, which are uh, um, or all the sections before this page it will all be knowledge area wise you can see the way the chapters are organized they are all knowledge area wise they will pick up one of one knowledge area one by one and they will talk about all the processes you know falling into that knowledge area across different process group but in annex one standard for project management of a project pmi has uh, given this information how you can follow in the process group wise. I will show you that I'll show you one of the chapter from here. Let me take you through the stakeholder that is 391 If I go to this one of the knowledge area here It tells me that what are the different processes I have in that knowledge area Okay, so this is based on the knowledge area depending on the process group uh, um, you're falling into and if i go to the next annex and here it talks about the organization of this processes with respect to the process group so here you can see they are talking about when you are in the initiating process group, what are process you are going to follow. When you move to the planning process group, what are process you are going to follow. When you move to the executing process group, what are process you need to follow and so on. So they have picked up these process groups here. So initiating process group. We can see in initiating process group, there are only two processes. So when your project is passing through the initiating stage, you need to carry out these two processes coming from different different knowledge areas when your project move into the planning stage then you need to follow these many processes okay they are all coming from the different different knowledge areas you're coming from scope time cost quality hr and so on when you move to the executing process group then you need to follow all these areas so <coughs> i'm sorry it's for the uh, to prepare for the PMP examination go through everything you must read entire PMBOK cover to cover at least once do not even think of going for PMP examination without reading this okay and when we 
talk about the practical application that what is to be done in what order we should do in a real life scenario then you should refer to this standards of project management for a project okay which is in 417 because in a practical scenario you may want to go process group wise that first of all let me identify what is it i need to do in the initiating process group then let me figure out what all i need to do in the planning process group and along with that depending on uh, the subjectivity i mean based on the subjectivity whether it is a iterative uh, life cycle you are following or the overlapping that you are following you will decide what process to follow in the planning and executing in what order remember pmi does not expect you to or pmi has no guidelines that you must follow all the processes in a particular sequence or in fashion of course there are some dependencies hard dependencies among the processes for example you cannot start your project or you cannot move on to the uh, your uh, identify stakeholder or the planning process if you have not done this process but when you come to this stage this is up to you that in what order you want to follow this processes or in what order you want to follow these processes that is subjective that is something that the project manager and the team will decide okay so the important question it talks about important uh, important question that it answers is in what order we must follow it okay so i hope i was able to clarify this i hope i was able to shed some light on this if you have any questions here please ask because this is a very very important from the examination perspective does each process generate one deliverable okay so rory to answer your question i will again take you through a process first of all okay i do not want to give a answer which will confuse you but let me take you here let's look at this process okay develop project charter okay. so we do not use this word deliverable for the process but we say output each of the process is going to give you some output that output may be in the form of a project deliverable or that output may be just require some updates in some of the documents okay when you go to the execution when you look at some of the processes in the execution then definitely there would be a deliverable here but when you go to some of the monitoring controlling processes when you go to some of the planning processes all you are going to get is probably an a document or maybe an update to the document okay. so when you plan for the project when you identify the scope and prepare your work breakdown structure you will identify what are the deliverables of the project you will identify what are the internal deliverables and what are the external deliverables of the project and based on that you can see whether this process is giving you any of this internal or external deliverable or not but each of the process will definitely give you some output does it answer your question rory okay great thank you so uh we'll move to next and i'll go to page number 61 and what we are going to do is to do a complete and a quick 360 degree overview of our uh, pimbo guide i am going to follow the uh, uh, approach which will be process group wise so we will review the processes which are there in the initiating process group and then we will review the processes which are in planning and then executing and so on and i'll tell you where this processes will have to be in a in some sort of sequential manner where the process will have to be some overlapping or maybe in a repeatable repetitive fashion okay so starting with initiating process group and the very first in the project has to be develop project charter so develop project charter is a process which is going to give you a very important deliverable that is project charter and project charter 
is a document which authorizes a project manager to use the resources of the organization to carry out the project work okay, or to do the project. Project charter is signed by project sponsor, approved by the project sponsor. Okay, or you can say project charter is released by the project sponsor. There may be a question like this in the PMP examination that who has authority to release a project charter and it is always and always project sponsor. Project manager is identified during the charter process in the project charter name of the project manager will be documented that this particular person will be the manager, but it will always be approved by the sponsor and this how uh, uh, this charter how it gets approved and signed off by the uh, sponsor is uh, there has to be some criteria some justification so you your company may want to look at some of the business cases they may want to use look at some cost benefit analysis that is it beneficial is it in the interest of the organization to do this project there would be some has to be some justification for that and most importantly whether it complies with the organization guidelines and policies or not so your management board will review all these things and then they are going to give a go ahead for the project and then project sponsor is going to release the project charter and after the project charter is released and signed off by the sponsor now the project manager will become the captain of the ship so in another words project charter can be considered as an agreement between the senior management of, of the organization and also the project team or the project manager and another important point here is project charter must must never be shared with the customer Okay. It is an internal document and it must be available only to the identified or selected people because it may carry some of the very confidential information about the project as well. Okay. Not necessary that everyone in the project team must have an access to that. So what I do is uh, I actually ask uh, people to prepare a charter, a full-fledged charter and I also ask my team to prepare a mini charter. So mini charter is something which will talk only about the objective of the project or maybe the boundaries of the project which team must be aware of and the project charter the the main project charter will be confidential document and only few people will have access to that. Okay. Once the charter is released then we move to the next process which is your identify stakeholder let me increase the font size so everyone can read it comfortably the next process immediate process that you must do before you do anything in the project is your identify stakeholder. So identify stakeholder is the process where project team or whoever are the key people who are involved in the initial stage of the project will sit down and find out who are the stakeholders in the project. Okay. Who are the people who can influence the project, who can impact the outcome of the project, who are the people who may or who will get impacted by the outcome of the project. Make a comprehensive list of all the stakeholders. And remember, project charter is a process which you do only once. Develop project charter will be carried out only once in the entire project. Okay, But identify stakeholder is a process which may have to be repeated which we may get repeated during the course of the project because as you move ahead in the project some people will get added some people will move some people will join you remember that progressive elaboration progressive elaboration it means as you move ahead you will get the granular details about the project and as granular you go, as detailed you go, you may identify, oh, I'm getting into this level. I need some support from that particular team. I need some support from that person. Or maybe this is the area where I can actually get some guidance from one of the, uh, our customer only. So this is something that you must review on a frequently basis and update and uh, uh, information as and when needed. Okay. After you have identified the stakeholders, then is the time you are good to start with your planning processes. Now, 
from this point onwards uh, uh, you know you will have to understand the difference between the project integration management and all other processes okay. so project integration management covers uh, uh, is made up of all the high level processes high level process means when you talk about project scope management you can see it has all the processes which are related only to the scope of the project when we talk about the project time management it covers all the processes which are from the taking care of the time management area time uh, related to the schedule when you talk about the cost management it has all those processes which talks which will be helpful to manage the cost of it but when we go to our integration it does not talk about any specific element of the project but it talks about project as a whole it talks about the overall project end to end okay so develop project management plan is a high level process which is a part of your project integration management and remember project manager will be directly responsible for all the high level processes in project integration management so develop project management plan is a process where we are going to develop our master project management plan and uh, one of the key input i will take you to this process here let me just go to that that process because it's important for you to see the process okay when you come to your 4.2 it has to go further okay so this is the process map here uh, you know the, your your input tools and techniques and output so develop project management plan takes project charter as an input output from other processes along with enterprise environmental factor and opa now this output from other processes is very very crucial and very important here i will go back to page number 61 so what are the processes it is talking about okay so there is a question i don't know where from where i got this question are the 10 knowledge areas to be followed in a linear fashion not exactly project integration definitely stands out and scope time cost quality hr communication you will have to use your own discretion but if i have to answer this question uh, and the logical way of looking at this is before i plan any of the element of the project i must know what is the scope okay and when they are going to be done and what will be the cost because when you look at this triple constraint when you look at the constraint of this project let me go here and draw something here with my very poor drawing skills when we talk about this triple constraints of the project okay when you talk about this one side you will have your scope one side you will have your time and one side you will have your cost or budget and in the center you will have quality this is the balanced triple constraint now as a project manager your responsibility is to ensure that you are always getting a perfect triangle it means all the competing factors or the constraints of this projects are aligned properly any change or variation in the scope is going to impact your time any variation in your time may impact your scope and it will have it may impact your cost it may impact your quality as well any variation in the cost will definitely impact your scope or maybe time as well okay and quality also so what you need to do is these three knowledge areas specifically you need to actually use your discretion and you need to do this in a fashion where uh, when you are defining the scope when you are creating the wbs if you feel that the scope part is probably overstretched or maybe too short then you need to fine tune it when you fine tune it your time and your cost will get impacted at the same time your quality also can get impacted you may require different set of people or maybe additional workforce for workforce for workforce for that you may also may you may have to interact with a different set of people so 
so you may have to relook at your communication plan it may increase or decrease the risk in the project so you need to balance it out so i would not say that you have to follow it in a particular fashion but the logic says first of all you need to have clarity on the scope and as you are developing the scope parallelly you will work on your schedule parallelly you work on the cost because all these elements are interlinked if i go back to the slide which i had shown you earlier uh this one yeah this one you can see all these areas are dependent are highly dependent to or linked to each other okay so i leave that on you you decide in what order you need to do pmi does not have any guideline pmi does not say that all the processes must be followed in a particular fashion so develop project management plan is a high level process which uses one of the input as output from other processes now what are those outputs so that is uh, i mean those outputs are output from your create wbs process output from your develop schedule process output from your determine budget process okay output from your plan quality management so when you go to this process let me just take you through the process map again that was probably 72 if you look at this process map here develop project management plan you can see it is using output from communication plan cost hr procurement process improvement quality management requirement management so all these inputs will be consolidated integrated and then you will come up with your project management plan which can also be called as your master project management plan okay once that plan is ready then you can move to the next phase but let's move not move to the next process group execution let's review all the processes uh, that you need to follow to get all these uh, information okay so let me go back to page slash page 61 here first i would suggest that you start from the scope management and the project scope management and parallelly you can start developing your time management and cost management as well now if you pay attention to these processes subsidiary i will call them as a subsidiary processes okay if you look at the first process of project scope management first process of project time management first process of pro plan cost management cost management and so on you can see the name is plan scope management plan cost time cost plan time plan schedule and all so these are the processes where you will define your approach towards it okay like plan scope management you will document what all process or what steps you will have to take to identify and finalize the scope who will do that you will also document your roles and responsibility okay so once your approach is defined then you will collect the requirement following the process following the steps which you have already identified in the plan scope management and based on that you will come up with a preliminary scope statement or a scope statement which will be the output of your defined scope so scope statement is a document which you need to share with your customer it will give you a description of the product scope that what is it that you are going to deliver and you will also have to document that what is it that you are not going to deliver delete deliver for example the objective is to develop a uh, an application for example let's say an application Okay. so application is the deliverable final deliverable but you can also document that the training will not be a part of this project customer need to pay separately for this training so the advantage of this is it is going to make things crystal clear whether this will be a part of your deliverable or not okay so this must be agreed by all the key stakeholder by the stakeholder and by the project team Okay, so there is a question from uh, Thambilan. Oh, I'm sorry if I'm uh, pronouncing your name incorrectly. Please uh, uh, excuse me for that. With change management, change being part of the project management. When, oh, okay, Thamba. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, when change being part of project management, when do you develop a change management plan? 
change management plan there is no specific process process defined for the change management uh, or to develop your change management plan but it is considered as a part of your project management plan so you will have to develop that you will have to develop that separately but change management sometime uh, you know you can actually use it as it is as well so suppose your organization has a policy or a guideline for the change management which you will have to use without making any changes or any specific to that okay so when do you do that before you finalize your project management plan you must do that okay mike uh, we will come to that part i have a separate slide to make you understand that okay uh, i i will park that question for a later stage but uh, when we come to the, to that point monitoring and controlling i will definitely take you to through that and uh, i have a specific slide for that also i'll just give you the glimpse of that okay so this is where i define that why we need to have separate processes okay and we'll move on to the next one that is your uh, scope so once you have the scope statement then you will prepare your work breakdown structure where you do the decomposition of your high level deliverable into smaller pieces parallelly when you completed your scope management plan at the same time you probably you should complete your plan schedule management as well where you are going to define your approach your policy your procedure your guidelines and roles and responsibility for the schedule management like how the schedule will be defined what tools you are going to use to define the schedule what will be the unit of duration whether it is going to be calculated or estimated in hours or in minutes or in days or in months or in weeks then you start elaborating this create wbr this work breakdown structure so remember this process gave you work breakdown structure and the 6.2 define activity is the next step of that so whatever work breakdown structure you have created now you need to define activities for that and next step will be sequence that activity estimate how many resources you need for that activity find out how much time you need for that and then you develop your schedule here so develop schedule is something that is going to we, we are going to use one very important activity there that is critical path analysis so i am going to cover critical path uh, you know towards a later part of the session uh when is the scope interrogation done there is a question from themba again scope interrogation uh, i am sorry i am not very clear with the scope interrogation do you mean to say scope check or uh, scope control control scope so uh, i uh, i understand by this word interrogation as uh, uh, when you are going to check whether your as per plan or there is no scope creep that we will do during control scope okay so after you have done your critical path analysis and you have done all your if and uh, when uh, um, uh, you know um, if what scenario what well, sorry what if scenario analysis when you have done all the worst case and best case scenario analysis you will come up with your schedule so output of your create wbs is going to give you the scope baseline output of dev schedule is going to give you your schedule baseline similar way okay themba there is a question point from themba again scope check to ensure to be sure what to deliver the okay that we are going to do in monitor and control when we come to the control scope so uh develop schedule will give you your scope uh, schedule baseline and plan cost management so normally uh, all these processes the plan scope management 5.1 6.1 7.1 8.1 you will actually have to develop them in parallel you will not wait for your scope to be completed so that you can start on the time no your approach your guidelines your tools processes will be defined in the early stage so 5.1 6.1 7.1 8.1 9.1 all these first process of the knowledge area will be running concurrently okay so in plan cost management you would have documented your approach that what is the currency you are going to use what is the currency conversion mechanism you need to use what tools you are going to use for the cost estimation and based on this approach that you define 
based on the roles and responsibility given to these people that those team members will start estimating the cost. Now, estimating cost is a, has a significant, uh, uh, sig significant dependency on your defined scope and your WBS and also in your activity resource requirement and activity duration because depending on the uh, time, depending on what point of time you're using certain resources, the cost may increase, isn't it? Depending on the length of the duration or length of the time for which you need the resources or you need to carry out the work, your cost will be impacted. So you will have to strike a balance here. Always remember this triangle. Keep this in your mind that whatever you do in your scope may impact your time and cost and quality. Whatever do you, in, you do in cost may impact your scope and time and other way wrong. So you have to strike a balance. Keep doing this work in a sink so that you get the best results. Okay. And uh, once you have estimated cost for each and every activity, then you go to determine the budget. So this is a place where we are going to integrate the cost. We are going to uh, sum up the cost, your whatever work breakdown structure or activities we had for which we estimated the cost. We are going to roll it up. We are going to sum it up so we can see the our overall project cost and then we are going to add up something for the reserve or something for the contingency which can be utilized during any unplanned event which is your risk and you will top that up with your reserve and then we are going to submit the final budget and this process determined budget is going to give us our cost baseline okay. parallelly you will have to develop your quality management plan so Quality is something that is, okay, let me ask you a question and type in your answer in the chat window. Who defines the quality? Who defines the quality in a project? Fantastic. I can see a lot of answers coming up and some of the people have got it right. It is the customer. It is always the customer who defines the quality of the project. Who will give you the quality goals? For example, uh, I'll give you a very generic example. You go to a restaurant and you order your favorite dish. Let's say soup. You order soup in a restaurant. Okay. Organization uh, and you have certain expectation that I want soup to be in a particular fashion. I want this soup to be spicy. I want this soup to be hot and you must serve some uh, you know, some butter or maybe some uh, soup stick along with it. Okay. So there are some explicit quality objective which are given by the customer. So when you place your order, you tell the waiter that I want the soup to be spicy and I want some breadcrumbs in that. You will never ever tell him that please serve the soup only in the soup bowl because he can bring you the soup in the beer mug as well. So you gave your requirement which will be called as a yes that is specification Raghu that is a specification exactly. So you will give your explicit requirement or explicit specification. Waiter will take the order inside and the entire team will start working on that. Okay. There are some implicit requirement implicit quality goals that your restaurant the, that uh, who, whichever restaurant you are into they say that okay we follow some uh, stringent policies for the hygiene factor that each other tomato which is bought for the soup or vegetables must be washed properly and must be checked by the quality team whether that is washed and that is of good quality or not and while preparing the soup the chef has to follow certain processes chef has, has to follow, follow certain uh, uh, you know steps or process to ensure that you know it comes as per the requirement okay and when do you appoint the CCB I'll come to that Temba I'll come to that and one of the requirement let's say one of the requirement that you gave is I do not want soup to be thin I want a thick soup so this is a specification that you have given chef this information was passed into the inside team and they followed all these processes and the steps and guidelines and chef prepared the soup. Soup comes to you and when you take the first sip of the soup, you again scream or shout or tell the manager that this soup is not good. 
it this soup is not good it mean why it is not good because you had asked this soup to be spicy and the soup is not spicy it means one of the requirement that the customer gave was not met so that requirement will actually become the quality goal for the project team you asked you said or you specified that i want the soup to be thick but the soup that comes to you is actually thin it's a watery kind of soup it again did not fulfill your requirement so the project team missed another goal that's a quality non fulfillment of the specification or the requirements are uh, is actually the missing a quality goal so based on the requirement of the customer you will define certain parameters which will define the quality of the project and quality of the deliverable some of the quality goals objective can be implicit and some of them will be explicit okay and during the planning stage only you will when you make your change control plan or change management plan that is the time you will define your change control board okay so is missing the quality a scope creep no thamba missing the quality cannot be called as a scope creep okay scope creep is something that you are asked to prepare a tomato soup okay with within certain specifications and you actually added something else to it so scope creep is uh, when the customer orders that okay i want a soup and the waiter says okay sir it will be delivered to you in 10 minutes time or 15 minutes time and at the 12th minute you call the waiter again and then you tell him hey i forgot to mention please ensure there are bread crumbs into that and it is coming in time so that's a creep which is happening from the customer side and that is also a change okay to ensure that this change is uh, looked upon and considered and reviewed and you know uh, in corporate to the project the waiter must tell the customer sir we are already preparing the soup and the soup is almost ready if you want any addition to that you will have to extend the timeline by 5 minutes we need some extra time to do that okay so what we'll do is in the plan quality management we are going to define the quality objective we will define what will what are the specifications that we need to fulfill what are the parameters we need to fulfill and what are the standards we need to adhere to and who will do that roles and responsibility parallelly you need to work on your human resource management plan that how many resources you need with what skill set you need okay at what point of time you need depending on the role depending on the their cost you will decide how many people you need uh, that you will decide here in activity resource requirement Okay, and here you are going to prepare your organization structure. What will be the hierarchy, project team hierarchy? Who will report to whom? What are the different roles you are going to have in the project? What are the KRA for that? What is the responsibility? Okay, once you have that, you will have your score human HR management plan. Parallelly, you need to work on your communications management plan. That all the stakeholders that we identified in thirteen point one. What are their expectations? how we are going to meet that expectations that we will definitely discuss it in 12.1 but your 10.1 and 12.1 will go hand in hand we cannot look at these two processes in isolation okay so stakeholder i all the stakeholder will have some expectations we will identify what their role is what their expectation are and based on that we will define how we are going to fulfill their expectation and the only way we can fulfill their expectation is by providing them the right information at the right time in a right format to ensure that they are always engaged and their requirements are being fulfilled so we will plan how we are going to do the communication who will do that what will be the frequency what will be the scope of that that means uh, what all dashboard what all pointers you are going to include in your uh, uh, um, in your reports Okay. Uh, what tool you are going to use? What medium you are going to use? Is it going to be uh, uh, through email? Is it going to be through fax? Or is it going to be uh, uploaded on the SharePoint site and people will have access to that? And frequency? Is it going to be on daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis? 
okay so you will prepare everything document in your communication management plan and there is a question again from timber so what happened if the client asked you to finish the project earlier than the plan and okay so timber this is again question we are going to take up in your in our uh, monitoring and control when we do the execution and monitor control okay is that fine i'll park this question right now for the time we reach to monitoring and controlling okay uh, along with this communication parallelly we also need to work on our risk management so risk is uh, quite complex and quite crucial so you need to pay a lot of attention while uh, defining your risk management policies this will include uh, what what are the guidelines or you know what will define that you have a risk in the project so you can also you can document here that okay five percent or more than five percent uh, uh, cost variation will be considered as a risk it can be five percent it can be two percent it can be one percent sometime some of the delay is always expected when you have any external dependence in the project so the guideline will be it can be like okay one to two days of variation or delay up to two days of delay will be considered will not be considered as a risk but beyond two days two days to three days will be a low risk three to five days will be a mid risk and more than five days will be a high risk category and then what can be the different source of it in case of any risk who is going to act upon that who is going to take any action uh, what is the frequency because risk is something which is which is uh, quite uh, volatile and uh, you know sometimes it can be intangible also and the risk the event the impact of the event may change what is a risk today may not remain a risk tomorrow what is not a risk today may become a risk tomorrow okay so for that it is important that you keep on reviewing it revisiting the risk uh, from time to time so here you will also define the frequency at which you are going to do the risk and then you will identify the risk you will find out what are the different risks there and then you do the quality and quantitative analysis where you do your probability and impact analysis and you will also find out you know what is the monetary value associated with that you will document all this information in a document called risk register and based on all this analysis and the value you are getting you will define your risk response plan so risk response plan is something that uh, it's, it's basically a strategy that you are going to adopt so there are four different options available to you to respond to a risk you can avoid it uh, to respond to a negative risk okay because risk can be negative or positive if it is a negative risk it is considered as a threat if it is a positive risk it is considered as an opportunity so you will decide whether you want to avoid you want to accept you want to transfer or you want to mitigate in case of a threat in case of a positive risk or an opportunity you will have to document a strategy for each of the risk whether you are going to accept it transfer it enhance it or share it Okay. we cannot go to the further detail than this uh, uh, you know in case if you need any any additional uh, information on this you can touch base with me on the offline and i'll be glad to answer your queries there okay we have two more uh, processes uh, knowledge areas here that is plan procurement in case if you need to buy something from outside if you need to procure something from a vendor a third party then you need to define the guidelines here who will do that what type of contract we are going to follow so type of contract here is a very important topic in plan procurement management and you may get at least two questions from this area only so what type of contract is it a, a cost uh, this is uh, is it on the uh, time and cost and uh, it is basically on sorry time and material is it a cost and reimbursement or what type of contract it is who will do that Uh, what is the justification for that what is the rationally behind going to uh, a third party vendor okay you will document everything in your procurement management plan and parallelly or actually like you know in uh, uh, before you do anything you need to prepare your stakeholder management plan so stakeholder management plan is uh, okay raghu is asking if i can give an example of a positive risk yes i will definitely give you that since you asked for it let me finish this stakeholder management plan and then i'll come to that whatever or whoever was identified during this process identify stakeholder we need to find out how we are going to manage the expectations of that stakeholder okay so we will do our anal an analysis here in uh, power versus interest rate analysis and based on that we can define here that okay all these people 
who are very high in power, who are very high in interest. Okay? So these are the people who need to be managed proactively. So the strategy for that will be that project manager must engage with that person who is very high in power on a weekly basis and must provide a proactive information to that stakeholder. Okay. So we, when we define the strategy that, okay, uh, let me give you an example, uh, client manager. So client manager is one of the important stakeholder in your project. Client manager is high in power. He has very high power and authority in the project and his interest is also very high in this project. So the strategy to manage his expectation is that project manager is going to meet, uh, going to manage the client manager and provide proactive information. To execute this strategy, we will take help of our communication management plan. When communication management plan, we will say uh, that, okay, project manager will be meeting face to face with the client manager on a weekly basis. And these are the reports that he's going to share with the client manager. And you can document, you can list down the different kind of dashboard or the report that you're going to share them. And what all the, what will be the scope of the dashboard. So that is how your stakeholder management plan and communication management plan work hand in hand. Okay. And uh, Themba is asking, is the JPPS, uh, can you please elaborate what is JPPS? Uh, Themba, I am not very clear with JPPS. So till the time you type in, let me answer Raghu's question. He's asking, what is the example of a positive risk? For example, attrition is a, is a key problem, key challenge. Almost everyone faces at some point or any point of time. Uh, let's say Nishant is working in your team and Nishant is a very niche resource and very critical resource. And from your gut feeling, from your experience, with the, based on your interaction with the Nishant, you somehow feel that Nishant may resign. Okay. Now this is an event. If that happened, it can deviate the project. So you identify that as a threat. Okay. You start working on the project. Unfortunately, Nishant resigns. And you get a backfill. Now the backfill means you get a replacement resource. Now this requirement, the new resource which has come, when he joins the team and come on board, he start working, you realize that this resource is much better than Nishant, smarter than Nishant, faster than Nishant. And he can finish the work faster than Nishant uh, used to take. So earlier what was being perceived as a threat or a negative risk has now become a positive risk or an opportunity. Okay. So you will immediately execute or draft some strategy that you know how you're going to leverage on this. Another example of a positive risk could be price, uh, uh, you know, going down. Let's say you are working on a project which uses cement as one of the raw material construction. So uh, due to all the economic situation, you Assume uh, when you do the analysis, you realize that the, uh, the cost at which the cost of the cement at which you have done all the estimation, that cost may go down. If that cost go down, you would require, you need to invest lesser amount of money. So that is a positive risk or an opportunity. Okay. Remember, all the positive risks are opportunities and all the negative risks are threat. Yeah. Okay, so Thamba has come up with this uh, one, uh, joint project preparatory session. See, joint project preparatory session is something that is highly subjective, highly subjective, okay? And uh, you will normally in the project preparatory session, you will have to define as a project manager in a real life scenario that what exactly is the scope of this session. In PMP, there is nothing called as joint project preparatory session. It is completely subjective. Okay. How you're going to manage the expectation? PMI is giving you the guidance that you prepare your stakeholder register, note down the expectation of each of the stakeholder, prepare a communication plan. Now, these are the guidelines. 
Now you have formed a team for that joint project preparatory session. So that is absolutely fine. There is nothing wrong in that. Okay? But PMI is not asking you to prepare that team or having that session. That is up to you. So uh, before we move to the executing process group processes there and uh, uh, remaining process groups, I want to take you back to this presentation. So this is an area. This is a slide which I want you to understand. This must get imprinted in your mind. So this is Deming cycle. I'm sure all of you must have seen this at some point of time somewhere. Plan, do, check, act. And Ch change when you check and you act change accordingly in case if it is not as per plan so what it is asking you to do is plan whatever you have to do once you have planned then you do whatever has been planned when you do this work you will have the res work results or the deliverables you check whether those deliverables or the work result is as per plan or not and once you have the findings you act on that if it is exactly as per plan, fulfilling the requirement and expectation, you go ahead and close that deliverable. If not, you find out, you uh, dig deeper into that, you do root cause analysis, you find out the reason for the deviation and take appropriate action. You change, you bring in some change if needed. When you change, you update your plan and you redo the work. And we follow exactly the same process, same cycle here in our PMBOK as well. So we will do, we did our planning process. We did all the planning. Now we are getting into execution. As we execute, we will have the work results, which we are going to check in our monitoring control project work. We will do the check. And if everything is fine, it will move to the closed project it will be closed, the deliverable will be closed. If not, we will find out why there is a deviation, why it is not as per plan, and we will take the, make the change as appropriate. Okay, so directing and manage, direct and manage project work is a process where we carry out all the work, all the work that we had, all the activities that we had planned here. Okay. So what we did here is we planned each and every element and we got uh, uh, the output of these processes. These output were taken into developed project management plan where we prepared our consolidated project management plan. And once the plan was ready, we started working on it. As we work on it, we will have the work results or deliverables. And those work results or deliverables we will take to monitor and control project work. Okay. So executing the, uh, the processes that we are going to review now we will compare we will do actually both executing and monitoring and controlling in parallel okay. when we do our work so while the work is being done we need to take care of certain things okay so let us look at the processes which are in the executing group perform quality assurance so this is a very important and very interesting point to understand in quality management we have Okay, so Themba has a question, who signs off the plan and when is this done? Plan must be signed off by all the key stakeholders. Okay, so when we talk about the scope baseline, which is an output of your create WBS, it must be signed by and agreed by your customer, your project manager and sponsor and all the key stakeholders that everyone agreed that, you know, this is what we're going to deliver. Your same way, your schedule baseline and your cost baseline. Quality management plan, you may or you may not to discuss with your customer. HR management plan, you need not to discuss with your customer. Communication management plan, of course, your customer may not be, uh, uh, may not need to approve it other than some of the reporting requirement where customer may be very specific that, okay, we I want to see a dashboard every week. I want to see a dashboard every uh, quarterly, uh, sorry, a fortnightly. Risk management is something that uh, you will decide whether you want to share with your customer or not. But this master project management plan must be signed off by all. And when this should be done, of course, at the end of the planning. When you have completed your planning, then you're going to do that. There is no timeline defined for it that, okay, the total project, 50% of that must go towards the project management plan. 
and that is the time when you have to do that no that is subjective you will define define when the entire planning is done you will get the sign off from all the relevant stakeholders okay and then you move on to direct and manage project work and there are certain things that you need to take care of while you are doing the work and one of the most important of those activities is perform quality assurance so let us understand the quality part so there are three processes in quality plan quality perform quality and perform quality assurance and control quality plan quality is where you will define what is the quality goal what are the requirements explicit requirement of the customer what are the implicit requirement of the organization based on that you will identify certain parameters on which you are going to check the quality of the project and the deliverables and you will also identify the steps or the process which you need to follow to get the deliverable and you will also check how capable or how stable your processes are okay so what happens is i will get back to this slide your customer let's say this i'll get back to the same example you went to a restaurant and you ordered for a soup and you gave the explicit requirement that i want the soup to be spicy and i want the soup to be thick based on that the restaurant manager or the chef made a plan what they are going to do and he started following it so he said i am going to boil this tomatoes and vegetable for 20 minutes okay so before the plan was made finalized first of all the chef will have to decide whether the process that we have currently is capable of giving the deliverable within these guidelines or parameters or not from his experience the chef will say if we boil tomato and vegetables for 20 minutes we may get a very thin and watery soup so we need a process improvement so during the planning stage only he will identify that what improvement he need to make in the plan and that will be linked back to your duration that again will go to your duration so he reduces the boiling time from 20 minutes to 15 minutes as a part of the process improvement plan and which is going to impact or reduce your overall activity duration as well okay you made the plan changes and the plan said that you have to boil it for 15 minutes now the execution starts chef starts preparing it so while the soup is being prepared okay one of one of another uh, element that he identified is that soup must be boiled at 100 for 15 minutes at 120 degree centigrade okay so while the soup is being boiled chef is checking from time to time whether it is being boiled at the correct time or not, at the correct temperature or not okay whether it is uh, you know, being boiled correctly or not whether it is uh, it is filled with the adequate uh, amount of water or not so that is something where he is checking whether the process is being followed or not so that activity is called as audit and the key activity that you do in perform quality assurance is a audit and remember audit is always and always done on the process okay once that process is followed and you did your execution you will have work results or deliverables okay when you do this work you will have the results or deliverable and that result you will take to your check where you do the monitoring control so check is something which is again uh, first the team who is working on that or let's say the chef who is preparing it before it goes to anyone else chef will taste the soup and he'll say perfect yummy delicious it is exactly as per the requirements given to me okay so he says the thickness is uh, sorry the uh, spiciness is fine everything is fine but i feel that it is slightly watery it is not thin it is not thick so he identified he checked that he compared the results with what was the plan and then he realized that it is not as per plan not meeting the expectation then he will get back to his 
from so okay so after the work result is done deliverable he will do this checking in the control quality control quality he will do the inspection and inspection is always and always done on finished or completed deliverable remember audit which is done in perform quality assurance is always done on process and control quality where you do inspection is always done on finished or completed deliverable so when this chef did the control quality or when he did the inspection he realized that it is not as per the requirement and then he need to do a process analysis which will be again be a part of your perform quality assurance so process analysis he will check whether the process is giving is there any deviation in the process or not is the process stable or not and based on the finding of the process analysis the chef may come and say okay we need to make some changes to the process and that change once the plan is finalized once the all the base times were chosen then no one in the project team or any of the stakeholder has any authority to make any changes to the project element elements without following the process of change so chef will immediately do the process analysis come up with a finding and he says okay we need to reduce the time that we are using to boil the tomato and vegetables and he gave a recommendation to boil it for 10 minutes at 100 degrees celsius so that will go in a form of a change request and that change request will come to the perform integrated change control process where it will be reviewed by the change control board so change control board is formed during your planning stage as you must have seen that one of the input to the developer project management plan was change management plan so change control board is made up of uh, key stakeholders they will review they will review the results they will look at the uh, the nature of the change how crucial and how important it is and based on that they will decide whether the change should be approved or not in this situation change request will go to the change control board and in a uh, perform integrated change control process ccb will look into the findings and they will say okay approved so it will be updated into the plan and that's why you see a dotted line here from change it is going to plan it is updated and the chef will recook the food he will again prepare the soup and this change will also be documented so that when you plan the next project you consider these findings and you make your plan accordingly so you don't have to go through the cycle of change again next time he is doing that he will check the soup he will prepare recook the soup he will taste it and now when he is checking he says it is exactly as per the requirement it is there is no deviation it is absolutely uh, uh, fulfilling the requirement and then it will be considered as a accepted deliverable and it will go to the close okay so talking about this uh, uh, quality okay i'll come to uh, validate scope again later on so this is about your perform quality assurance at the same time you need to do uh, you know your process is coming from the hr management acquire project team develop project team and manage project team this is something that you will keep on doing in parallel once you are you identified in the planning stage that uh, uh, what kind of roles you need for the project what kind of uh, uh, responsibilities what should be the care of those uh, resources and stakeholders that you have then as and when needed you will acquire the team you will get the people on board and you will do the this uh, develop project team process develop project team is like you know setting the expectation doing the ice breaking and uh, uh, all this uh, training read need assessment and imparting the training and all and you'll also have to manage the team manage the team is where you look at your work results your deliverable you look at how each and everyone is performing how they are doing their work whether it is as per plan or not are they playing your, their role or not so you'll have a discussion with the team member you'll look at their their need their, their motivation you will have to use your uh, leadership qualities your uh, competencies of a uh, ideal project manager communicate with the people understand how they feel about the project and when you are doing this work you will have to manage communication let's say in communication management plan you agree that you are going to publish a report every week or let's say on a daily basis so as and when you make progress you are doing work every day you have to do the communication also so you can ensure that all the expectations of the stakeholders are being 
managed. Okay. At the same time, if there was any procurement requirement, you may have to carry out the procurement at the agreed time. You will be carrying out this procurement at the time that you defined here in your schedule. Okay. You will also do your managed stakeholder engagement. So when you are providing the communication, you will also ensure that this communication is helping you to fulfill the expectations of all the stakeholder. Okay. You will ensure that all the stakeholders are engaged. You must have seen and noticed that, you know, I am from time to time, I'm asking questions to you. I'm asking you to, uh, you know, give some answers. I'm asking for your feedback. So I am ensuring by this, I'm ensuring that all of you are engaged. Exactly the same thing you also need to do in your project. Okay. So when you do all this, they are all going to give you the work results and those work results will be checked here in your monitor and control project work. Okay. Now let me take you through this slide, which is quite interesting slide here. Okay. How these processes, all the processes, I'm sorry, I'm going to, uh, you know, minimize the question window. So in case if you have any questions, okay, I can see one question from Themba. Are those stage gates? Uh, when you make your plan, you will decide that, you know, what are stage gates you're going to have or you could, what are toll points you're going, you're going to have, okay, or at what stage you're going to review that. You can consider that as a stage gate as well. You can consider that as a checkpoint or toll gate as well, but it is all a part of your methodology. Are you doing it on a frequently basis? Are you doing it at end of each uh, completion of each deliverable? That is, you have to decide. And you can call it as a stage gate. You can call it as a checkpoint. You can call it as a toll gate as well. Okay. So I'm going to minimize this question window. Uh, let me take you through this slide for another three to four minutes. And then I'll see if you have any questions there. Okay. So this is a logical sequence at a very, very high level. We developed our project charter, outcome of this process or project charter. And once the charter was ready, we prepared our project plan in developed project management plan process and the outcome of this was project plan. Then based on this plan, we started doing the work. When we do the work, we will have two important information coming from that or output, sorry, not information, two important outputs coming from that process. That is your deliverable and work performance data. Okay. That work performance data and deliverable will be taken to the control processes of these respective subsidiary knowledge areas. Okay. How? Let me take you there. So you can see in monitoring and controlling process groups, there are processes 5.5, 5.6, validate scope, control scope, control schedule, control cost, control quality. Okay. I hope uh, you remember I told you project integration management has the processes which are not related to any specific element of the project, but they cover the entire or the overall aspect of the project. But when we talk about project scope management, it has processes which will give you information associated with the scope of the project. Time management will have the schedule related processes. Cost management will have the cost related process. So that information we need to take to this respective area. For example, let me minimize the go to the edit mode. For example, when you did this work, you got this deliverable. That means some work completed and you also got work performance data. So when you read these processes, you will uh, get to know about all these acronyms and abbreviations. So WPD is called as work performance data. Let me increase the size here so you can see this clearly. Now work performance data is a raw data and that raw data is uh, like, uh, so you completed a deliverable and this deliverable took, let's say seven days. It took seven days time and you spent close to $200 on that. Okay. So this is the raw data without any additional information. Now from this seven days and 200 these two information, we will find out seven days. It is related to duration. We will take this information to our control schedule process. In control schedule process, we will do a 
comparison or we will do a variance analysis. We will find out that this deliverable that we have completed, how much time it was supposed to take. Then we are going to look at our plan. Plan says this work should have taken five days time. So when we do the compare variance analysis, we know there is a negative variance of two days and that negative variance of two days will now be called as work performance information. And the work performance information will say there is a negative variance of two days. Okay, so work performance data is your raw data and work performance information is your analyzed raw data, analyzed data associated with that deliverable. Similar way, when we take this information $200 to our control cost process, okay, let me write it next to the control schedule so it doesn't confuse you. When we talk about this process here, uh, sorry, cost here $200 and we look at our uh, variance analysis and control cost, we realize that we were supposed to spend only $175 on this work but we ended up spending $200. So there is a negative variance, which will be called as work performance information. Okay. So now we have the variance, this information for the schedule. Now we have this variance information from the cost. And if I have some variance in my schedule for one particular activity, it is definitely going to impact my entire project. Isn't it? So what I'll do is I will take this work performance information to this process, which is monitor and control project work. And here I'm going to check how this deviation is going to impact my overall project. Okay. So here in this one, minus two days, I am talking about only one particular deliverable of that. What is the deviation in that deliverable? When it comes to this part in monitoring control project work, I will look at the overall impact of this deviation and then I am going to publish my work performance report. And that report will say, because of this deviation, the milestone which you are supposed to achieve on 10th of May will now be is now estimated to be completed on 15th of May or 12th of May. Okay, so that is your work performance report. So the important information that we learned in this one is the difference between work performance data, work performance information and work performance reports. Is that clear to everyone? Just write it here in the chat window so I can uh, find out. Okay, thanks Randy. Fantastic. Okay, so there is a question from Randy. Uh, Randy, I'm, uh, I uh, think you probably missed the earlier session. I had uh, taken this uh, team to the beginning of this one. Why it is starting from the four? So we have chapter one, chapter two, chapter three like this. So in first three chapters, we have introduction, introduction to the project management, project, project management, framework, organization, and also the process and process framework. So the knowledge areas start from the chapter number four and that's why we have the starting from four. In case if you uh, have some more doubt, I will, uh, uh, you know, after the session gets over, you please stay on for a few more minutes and I'll take you through that. Okay, so the question from Mickey is, uh, can you say that, can you say what WP reports again? Okay, fine, I'll take you through that. We did some work. And as a result of that work, we got deliverable and the work performance data, which is nothing but the raw data. Okay. We took this raw data to that corresponding control process, like this duration information we took to control schedule and con cost information we took to control cost. And there we did the variance analysis for that specific element of the project. And that gave us work performance information. So, a particular task or deliverable was delayed by two days. So what impact this delay of two days is going to have on the overall project? So let me draw something quickly here. If your activities, your tasks are scheduled like this. Uh oh, sorry.
if your tasks are scheduled like this, right now you are working at this task and this got delayed, there is a negative variance of two days here. Okay. So your work performance information will talk about only this part of the work. But when you take this to your monitoring control project work, here you are going to check the overall impact of this deviation that how the future activities are going to get impacted and if there is a milestone at end of it, what will be the impact of that. So you prepare a work performance report, you prepare a WPR here and you are going to say because of this deviation here, so this is how, this is how the plan is. I am sorry for my poor drawing here. This is how we have progressed so far and based on this progress, this is our forecast. Okay. So this information is going to come up in your work performance report. Overall progress information will be a part of your work performance report. Okay. Similar way, your cost, variance at cost, that again will be taken to the monitor control project work and here it will tell you that okay, the overall spend so far was supposed to be $1,000 but we ended up spending $1,100 or, 11, uh, or $1,025 and if we continue to uh, be at this pace, by the time the project gets over, we would have overspent by let's say $200 or $500. That is your work performance reports. So always remember, work performance data is a raw data, work performance information is a analyzed data for that specific deliverable or the activity and work performance report is your complete project information which is published electronically about the overall project. Okay. Is it clear now? Okay. Is WPA report an input for the closed project processes? No, it is not an input, but this report will be archived. You will update your OPF with this. And when you go to the, when all the deliverables, okay, let me take you to this slide. When all the deliverables of this project are completed, okay, when you have done this entire process, I mean, you have done this multiple time, everything is done. And then you will take it to this last process, which is close project or phase. And that is a time when you had to do some postmortem or the review of the, how the project was done. And that is a time when you are going to pull out all the WPR report. Let's say in a charter or maybe before charter, customer put a condition that if you miss any of the milestone, we are going to put 5% of the total invoicing amount or billing amount as a penalty. So during the close project phase, you will check how many milestones you missed, how many milestones you overachieved or how many, I mean, how the project work was done. And based on your agreement, you will take a call. So Themba has a question, uh, will that not have been a mistake during estimation, lack of, uh, Themba, there are multiple factors which may be out of our control. And that is why we need to do this monitoring and controlling more, more religiously and more rigorously. Okay. Uh, you did the estimation based on certain factor. Let's say, let, let me put it this way. You have a new resource in the team who comes with a 10 years of experience. So you assume that that resource will be able to complete the work in time. But when he, that resource start working, you realize that he is not as capable and as efficient that he had, uh, as he had mentioned in his CV. Because of that, the work is now getting delayed, deviated. So of course, it was a, a mistake, but again, there was no way in the world you could have identified it in the initial stage. And that is called as experience. Okay? So you as a project manager will have to uh, identify, you will have to find out you know, what corrective or what preventive actions you are going to take for that. Okay? So that you do not repeat this in future and that is the purpose of having these checkpoints on a frequently basis. So you can take the question, you can take the corrective or preventive actions in time. Okay? So uh, Dennis has a question, how to calculate the cost, what should be considered? Yes, uh, for cost estimation, you know, we need to go through the details of this uh, estimate cost process. So this, these processes, you know, estimate cost. Estimate cost is heavily, heavily dependent on your estimation of resources and estimated activity duration and also the work that they're going to do in defined activities. Uh, 
we do not have luxury of time to get into the details of this but i will be glad to answer your questions after the session gets over or maybe uh, uh, sometime later okay so coming back to my slide here pdca okay uh, just one point to add dennis uh, i have very interesting topic here that is earn value management so during the earn value we will may not be able to check the estimate but we will also we will definitely do the uh, variance analysis okay so we will keep on doing this and we'll repeating this cycle until and all the deliverable all the work is completed and then only we'll go to the close project or phase process okay. so uh, i will not get into the detail of each and every process we need to check for control cost scope schedule cost quality but one important point that i want to emphasize on the difference between this control quality control scope and validated scope processes this is something where i have seen most of the people make mistakes while answering the question so let us understand this uh, slide here okay. so i will start from this direct and managed project work when you are doing the work you will have the deliverable and work performance data and i hope everyone understand what is deliverable or work performance data is r deliverable is your work result and the work performance data is a raw data okay so let's say the soup you prepared the soup and now the soup is ready once the soup is ready you will take it to the control quality control quality i told you is the process which is 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 done only when any you have any finished deliverable or the work result you cannot do this process half way through okay suppose you agreed with your customer or with the stakeholder that you will do a report or you will do the uh, project review on a frequently basis uh, at a particular frequency let's say daily basis or uh, weekly basis now at that point of time irrespective of whether the deliverable is complete or not you will check whether the work is being done as per plan or not whether it is as per the scope requirements or not okay so that is something you do in the control scope so if in a week's time you are supposed to complete 60% of the work so you will check whether you have completed 60% of the work or not okay if yes fine if no then you need to find out why there is a deviation and you do the root cause analysis find out the reason for the deviation find out the reason why you are not able to complete the time and if needed you raise a change request for example let's say resource was not working the resource that you have is very slow or maybe for some reason he is not available because of that the entire work is delayed so you are supposed to complete 60% of the scope of the deliverable but you have completed only 40% of that so you will raise a request that i want to change this resource even project manager does not have an authority to make any changes after the plan is finalized and the baseline was saved so suppose the deliverable is completed and once it is completed then it will go to the control quality so i will get back to my favorite example of soup okay chef prepared the soup and now the time to do the testing so chef will do the taste will taste it and chef says it is perfectly fine yummy it is exactly as per the requirement given to me so the input to the control quality process is called as deliverable which is coming from direct and managed project work and once the deliverable is checked by the internal team okay it will be called as verified or validated deliverable so once the soup was prepared chef tasted that soup and once he gives okay and go ahead it will be called as verified or validated deliverable and then only it will be presented to the customer or any senior stakeholder who has the authority to say yes this deliverable meets the requirement fulfills our expectation and requirement and that you will do in validate scope okay so important point to remember here is control quality is a process which is done by the performed by the internal team 
if you are in IT, you will probably do the testing. If you are in construction, before you go to, uh, to hand over the building or your work to your customer, it will be checked by the internal team where they will take the measurement whether it is done or complete as per requirement or not. Once it passes through the internal check or QC, then only it will be presented to the final, uh, to the end customer. Or now this uh, from as per PMI, this your key stakeholder can be your customer. It can be, sometimes it can be the project manager. Sometimes it can be the sponsor also. Whoever has authority to say that, yes, this work is completed will be a part of this validated scope. So chef prepared the soup. He tasted it. He verified and validated that. And now it will go to, let's say, the restaurant manager. So before the soup goes to the customer or the manager will check, or maybe it will straight away go to the customer. So it will come to you and you will taste that and you'll say yummy, delicious. It is exactly as per requirement. And then it will be called as accepted, accepted deliverable. Okay. And this will be a part. So when you are closing the project, when all the deliverables are completed, then you're going to review the list of all the accepted deliverable. So think it this way. You order your soup. You order, let's say four or five dishes in the main course. Then you order some desserts. So it is not that every time they are serving you a dish, they are going to give you a bill along with that. Yeah. So they are going to give you all the deliverables, all the dishes that you had asked for. Once you complete everything and once you are done with that, you wash your hands, you ask for a check, then only you're going to receive the check where you will see, okay, soup was fine, main course was fine, desert was fine, or in case if there was any problem, you will say, the soup was not as per requirement. I had asked you for a spicy soup, but you gave me a mild spicy or low spicy soup. So, I will not agree to it. If the soup was not presented in a right fashion, you will say, I am okay, I had to pay for that, but I am not happy with the services. If the dish, if the bowl in which it was served, that bowl was not clean, that was a deviation from the internal or implicit quality requirement. You will say, you gave me soup in a dirty bowl, I am not going to pay for that. Okay. So all these things you are going to review during your closed project. So just going by one step backward, if the chef, when he was testing the soup, if he had found that the soup is not as per the taste or the requirement given to him, it will again be, it will again require a change whatever, wherever is needed. It may be in the quality of the ingredients. It may be in the time. It may be in terms of process or anything. And that request will go to your integrated change control process. No one in the project has authority to make any changes without getting approval from the change control board. Once it is approved by the change control board, then it will go to your, it will be updated into the PM plan and you will have to redo the work in direct and manage project work and repeat the entire cycle. If chef tasted that and passed it, it goes to the customer and customer says, no, this is spicy, it's fine, but it is still thin. It is watery. I don't, I cannot accept it. Can you change this? Can you give me another bowl of soup? So customer has rejected the deliverable here. So it is no longer accepted deliverable. From here, again, the team will find out why it failed. It will go to integrated change control and you will follow the process and you will repeat the process and you will keep on doing this until you have the accepted deliverable coming from the validated scope. And then only it will be a part of your list of all the accepted deliverables, which you are going to review when you are closing the project that whether all the deliverables that you're supposed to deliver were, were accepted by the customer or not. Okay, so I'll reiterate on few points. First is control quality is done only when the Deliverable is completed or finished. Okay. Control scope is not dependent on the completeness of the product or the deliverable, but it is related to the frequency or it is related to this work that, you know, at any particular point of time, how much work was supposed to get over and how much you have done. Okay. So at any given point of time, let's say you are supposed to complete 50% of work and you have done 40% of work, uh, uh, completed only 40% of work. So that comparison you'll do in control scope. Okay. And control quality is always done by the internal team, but validate scope is something where you're going to present your deliverable to the any stakeholder who has authority to accept or say this deliverable is completed. 
okay and remember these three terms deliverable verified or validated deliverable and accepted deliverable deliverable is a raw deliverable coming out from your direct and managed project work verified or validated deliverable is coming out from your control quality which is done by the internal team and once a customer accepted it will be called as accepted deliverable okay so uh, that was a very important point I wanted uh, you to understand and let me now look at the questions hmm. Okay, uh, Rajneesh, it's 2 a.m. Here. Uh, yes, definitely you're going to get the recording link and uh, Okay, he has already gone and uh, Themba has a question when can a project be cancelled or parked? Themba that actually can be done at any point of time at any point of time if your leadership team if your project management or your senior management team or the customer if they feel that the project is no longer making sense or it is not aligned to the organizational objective they have a right to cancel it okay so there is no point that you know you cannot cancel it for a project before this it can get cancelled at any point of time okay. Sanjeev has a question uh, in the previous diagram could you mean the monitor and control block okay so monitor and control project work is a process and as I told you your control scope control schedule control cost control quality these are the processes which will check or which will do the variance analysis only for that specific element of the project but monitor and control work is a process which will compare the results or which will do the variance analysis for the overall project and it will also give you the forecast forecasting for the overall project okay thanks thanks a lot Timber, for this uh, your uh, remark and uh, appreciation thank you uh, so, so Sanjeev, i hope i hope i was able to explain this are you clear with this or you want any further explanation Okay, I'll consider no news as a good news. Okay, yes, Sanjeev. With respect to the previous diagram, let me go to the slide here. Okay, and let me reduce the size. Do you mean this slide which I which I'm showing right now? Okay, okay. Monitor and control project work. So every time, you know, whatever you're doing, irrespective of whether there is a deviation or not, you will have to go to monitor and control project work. Let's say you completed a deliverable. It passed the control quality process. It was accepted by the customer also. It does not mean that you you need not to do this process. You will still have to do this process because the one of the important output of this monitoring control project work is work performance reports. Work performance report is a electronically published data or a graph or S curve or the overall project progress data, which will tell you, okay, by this time we were supposed to complete 10 deliverables and we have completed all 10. And based on the progress so far, this is a projection that we have for the future. That we are assuming that entire work will be done in time and within cost. Or if there are any deviation, we can do the forecasting that looking at the current scenario, this is the amount of deviation we expect towards the end of the project. So Temba is asking, is monitoring and controlling performed throughout the project? Yes, Temba, it is performed throughout the project. Okay. Uh, this is something you need to keep on doing repeatedly until all the work or all the deliverable is completed. What is the frequency that you will define? You as a project manager and the project team will define what should be the frequency of that. Okay. So we have all these processes here where we will do our controlling here. I will take back to this slide again. We will check for each and every element here okay this is, there is a question here let me just go through it okay is there any recommended percentage of slippage over on time recommended for the project or is this something uh yes actually rory very interesting question you asked so 
what she, what Rory is asking is the slippage. Who will define what is the permissible limit of variance? Very good question. That is something that you will agree. As a project team, you will agree when your plan scope management, plan schedule management, plan cost management. For example, when you do your cost estimation, cost is dependent on so many factors. So and many of them may be out of your control. For example, you do not control the inflation or you do not control the price of uh, crude oil in the international market. If that is going high, your project cost will increase or if that is going low, it may impact your project positively. Sometime when the forex ratio goes uh, low, it may impact your project negatively. So you will agree here that these estimates are you know, uh, close to the, uh, um, you know, uh, an, an approximation and plus minus 2% or 3% variance is accepted. And you will keep that as a part of your reserve. Remember when I told you about when we we're talking about the budget. So you will come up with the aggregation, aggregated cost of each and every activity. And then you are going to add something for the reserve towards the contingency or in case if there are any inflation, cost inflation, inflation or something. Similar way when we are talking about the schedule, as a project manager, you must always keep some buffer. And remember, do not inform your customer about the buffer that you have. In fact, I personally suggest that you must not inform about this buffer to your senior management also. Okay, because this is something this is this must be something private to you do not inform your team members also about it because if you tell your team member we are all human and you know our psychology works like this that okay we have completed this work but if i give it to you in time again i we have buffer of one day so let's fine even if it is getting delayed let it get delayed we still have one extra day in our hand no that should not be the trend so there is no percentage defined you as a project team will define as that so Thamba is asking is 10%. I really cannot say anything on that. Depending on the, on the organization. For example, uh, uh, you know, you work in an organization which is, which is uh, working in a very, very niche area or let's say very risk prone area. Uh, let's say you are in, uh, in pharma industry. You are working on uh, development of a new medicine. So in that kind of area, even a minor slippage in scope can be fatal. So you will say we work on the sixth level of sigma and the deviations cannot be accepted if they are beyond 99.99999 uh, 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 sorry uh, if the deviation is you know more than two parts per million or one part per million. If you are working with NASA then of course this is going to be similar way in terms of cost you can take the hit but not in terms of time not in terms of scope if a satellite has to be launched on a particular day it has to go in that day if you have sent a manned mission to uh, in space to the international space station and they had to come back at a certain point of time they have to come back at a certain point of time but if you are working on a website development and for some reason something got delayed you'll say okay it is our internal website we can afford one or two days delay so it's all subjective. Okay, so these are the questions. Uh, how do we combine with the performance bonus? Uh, this is something that is offline and it will be a part of your HR management policy, HR management plan. Okay. So I will quickly get back to your, uh, uh, um, our slide here. And uh, okay. So I hope this process is clear to everyone and this is the logical sequence and for the PMP examination, you must remember this and you must understand the logical flow more than remembering this. You must understand that what exactly happens, how the flow of information goes and you must understand and learn the difference between your deliverable, verified or validated deliverable and accepted deliverable. There may be a question in PMP like this that okay you are scheduling a meeting with one of the stakeholder, uh, one of the customer. So uh, which process you are doing? Are you doing your control quality or you are doing your validate scope? If you have scheduled a session with your customer to review the deliverable, you are definitely doing validate scope. Okay. 
and I'm sorry I missed there were some uh, few people raised their hand I'm not able to figure out uh, uh, but I hope your questions are answered so with this uh, if you have any question please type in now so so with this I quickly move on to the next topic uh, okay not next topic but the next process group which is our closing process group so in closing process group we have two processes uh, on the lag stack diagram yes Shikant we are going to cover that that's the next topic I'm going to cover which is our critical path I'm going to come to that topic also okay but uh, let us cover these two processes so close project or phase and close procurement so develop project charter is the very first process in your project and close project or phase must be and is the last process in your project uh, before that you need to close your procurements if you have bought or if you outsource any work or you decided to procure something from outside then you have to ensure that the procurement process or engagement with the vendor is also getting closed so whatever work was being done by the vendor you will do a review of that you will accept or agree on certain terms and you're going to uh, once the entire work to be done by the vendor is done then you will close the procurement you will do the negotiation you'll find out how did the vendor perform how many milestones they missed and if there was any uh, condition on that you're going to take the appropriate action once this is closed then you're going to close your project or phase so close project or phase one of the important uh, uh, input in this process is list of accepted deliverables what we need is our project management plan and our accepted deliverable and we will check with the key stakeholder or the customer whether all the work is done all the deliverables are completed and they were all accepted by the customer or the stakeholder and then you will do the administrative closure you will inform all the stakeholder that this project is completed and it is now formally terminated so i am talking about this page number uh, 526 of the pimbok definitions make sure you go through this section definitions and after definition there is something called as acronyms and you must go through these acronyms or the glossary also do not do not ignore this do not think that okay you have read the entire book uh, pinbox so we can ignore avoid this no you must go through the glossary you must go through all the acronyms because for the examination it is extremely important to become familiar with the pinbox terminology okay you may call this process of this work as any name in your organization in your country in your real life scenario but when it comes to PMP examination you must use the same definition same terminologies which are being used by the PMI so remember go through this glossary section in detail do not miss it okay and there is a question from Rory is notifying all the stakeholders of the closing for the project a part of the communication plan yes you must inform all the relevant stakeholder I will not use the word all the stakeholders I will say relevant stakeholders okay so let's say your vendor you completed the vendor completed the entire work okay and that that is uh, in the overall project scale it is actually somewhere in the midpoint so when your when your project is completed you need not to inform your vendor on that that we have completed the project you will notify only those stakeholders which are relevant and who are the relevant stakeholders that you would have decided you need to decide in the beginning of it and that will be somewhere here identity is identify stakeholder stakeholder and your communication management plan so the important topic that we are going to cover next is understanding critical path critical path is very very critical with respect to the PMP examination because uh, you can expect approximately seven to eight questions sometimes it can be more than that only and only from this topic and they're all numericals in this and these are all scoring questions 
all you need to understand is what is critical path and how it is calculated. So, so critical path is a basically a sequence of the activity which represent the longest path. Okay. So longest path in the project and also the shortest duration. So how critical path is identified? So critical path is the longest duration path and also the shortest time to complete the project. From the real life perspective or the PMP examination perspective, critical path is extremely important. So what we are going to discuss here is that how we can identify a critical path in a project. So it can be done using these three distinct operations or activities here. You calculate the forward pass and then you calculate the backward pass and then we calculate float. So let us see what this forward pass or backward path is. So I have a sample project here, very simple here. So I have task A when the project kick starts, I have task A and D starting. Completion of that will lead into the start of B. And when the B completes, your C and E will start. Completion on C and E will uh, lead into the start of F. And then our project will be finished. Now we need to identify what is a critical path here. So to identify critical path, first of all, we are going to calculate the forward path. Forward path means for each task, we will find out, we will calculate what is the earliest start date and early finish date for each activity. It means earliest possible start date for A and starting at this, what is the earliest time in which task A can be completed. So we are going to do this for all activities. Okay, let me just make some changes for task B. Okay, there we go. So we'll do it for all the tasks here. Oh, I'm so sorry. So there is some goof up here. So let us calculate this early start. Starting on project, when we are starting the project on the day one, task A will start. Having duration of one, six days, the earliest it can be finished is day six. Why day six? Because day one is inclusive. So you can count it starting on day one, one, two, three, four, five, six. The task A will get over on day six. Okay. And the way you can uh, to another way to calculate this is early finish is equal to early start. That is one plus duration that is six days minus one because we are starting it on day one. That's why we need to do the minus one in some of the uh, uh, projects or some of the people actually they suggest uh, that you start from day zero. In case if you're using day zero as a starting date, then you need not to do this minus one. It is just simple EF is equal to ES plus duration. Again, there is nothing right or wrong. This is a point of debate also. Uh, that you know we should start from day zero or day one there is nothing right or wrong I stick to the policy of starting at day one so I'll go with that in case if you want day zero you can just make some changes to that and you'll get the same results so starting on day one it will get over on day six and task D which is a parallel task will start on day one and starting on one having duration of seven days it will get over on day seven task A and D completion of these two will kick start the start of task B so even though task A is getting over on day six, but task D is getting over on day seven and B cannot start until A and D both are over. So the earliest start date for B is day eight and starting on eight having duration of five days, earliest finish date for task B is 12. Finish of B will kick start C and E. So since B is getting over on 12th, task C, and task E both will start on day 13. Task C having duration of eight days, it will get over on day 20. And task E having duration of nine days, it will get over on day 21. C and E both are getting, uh, they are getting over on 20 and 21 respectively. And finish of these two activities will kickstart task F. F has two predecessors, so it cannot start until both are finished. So the earliest start date for F is day 22. And having a duration of five days, it will get over on day 26. So this is our forward pass where we calculate early possible start date and early finish date for 
each and every activity. Uh, is it clear to everyone? Anyone has any question in the forward pass? Okay, thank you. So once the forward pass, you have calculated the forward pass, now we need to go backwards. We will calculate backward pass. And backward pass is we will start from this last day and we will calculate the late start and late finish for each and every activity. Okay, early, here we calculated early start, early finish, and now we are going to calculate late start and late finish. So going backward, this task is getting over on day 26. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, finish on day 26. To allow this to finish on day 26, latest by which it must start is day 22. Okay. To allow F to start on 22, C and E both must get over on day 21, latest by day 21. Now here, task C, to get over on day 21, latest by which it must start is day 14. And task E to get over on day 21, latest by which it must start, task E must start is day 13. So C and E both are starting on 14 and 13 respectively. Okay. C has no issues, but E has to start on 13. So task B must get over on day 12. If it goes beyond day 12, then this task will be delayed. So B has to get over on day 12 and to get over on day 12, latest by which it must start is day 8. And to allow task B to start on day 8, task A and D both must get over on day 7. And task A to get over on day 7, latest by which it must start is day 2. And D to get over on day 7, latest by which it must start is day 1. Okay, so this is your backward pass. Any questions on the backward pass? Is it clear to everyone? Yeah, Shikant. Uh, how did we get to as latest start? Okay, I will come to that. Uh, I'll explain that. Here you can see task A has a duration of 6 days and task D has a duration of 7 days. So task A and D both must get over on day 7. And task A to get over on day 7, latest by which it must start is day 2. Because if you count backwards from 7, so it is 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, day 2. The how I calculated this, I mean, you can use this formula as well here, which probably you're not able to see. Okay, I'm sorry, it, it is missed in this one. But, uh, you know, you need to include this day 7 in this. So, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. It must start on day 2. So, that is the latest start date. It means... If it goes beyond day 2, then you will not be able to complete it on 7. It will get pushed beyond this. Is it clear? Okay, thank you. And after we calculated the forward pass and backward pass for each activity, now is the time to calculate float. So formula for float is, I will take you to the next slide. Formula for float is LS minus ES or LF minus EF. Okay. So what we need to do is, we need to find out what is the float here. So LF minus EF, 26 minus 26 is 0 or LS minus ES. So that is also 0. Okay. You need not to do both. You need to do just either LF minus EF or LS minus ES. And you do this for all the activities and then you will be able to see the float here. So for task F, the float is 0, C is 1, E is 0, B is 0, D is 0, but A 1. And wherever you see the float as 0, it means it's a critical task. Now, let us look at this again. Task A, it has an op option that it can start on day 1 and finish on day 6 or it can start on day 2 and finish on day 7. Okay. No matter what path you take, it is not going to impact the next activity. Suppose there is a delay of one day, 
in this activity. Let's say activity A gets delayed by one day. Is it going to impact B? No. Because you have a buffer of one day. You have the float of one day. So float, slack or buffer, they are all one and same thing. Okay. If you look at task D, so no matter what path it is using, forward pass or backward pass, it has to start on day 1 and it has to get over on day 7. It cannot afford even a single day of delay. There is no buffer here. There is no float here. If this task gets delayed, your overall project finish date will also get impacted. Your next task will get impacted, B, and your finish date will get impacted. You will not be able to finish this on day 26. Okay? So that's why this will be identified as a critical task and all the tasks, all the critical tasks will form your critical path. Can you guess why we identify this critical path? Can you type in your chat window? What is the purpose of uh, or what we are going to achieve by identifying critical path? Okay. I can see a few answers here. Identify your schedule dates. Uh, Randy, yes, you're correct. But that you can identify even without, uh, even, uh, without identifying the critical path. And uh, uh, yes, Shikant, you got it right. Ensure there is no slippage on the critical path. And Randy, you're absolutely right to determine what task to monitor closely. I'll add this word, closely. And shortest time for the project, schedule variance, yes, absolutely correct. So, the purpose of identifying critical path is so that you can allocate your resources in such a way that they have minimum impact on your overall project schedule and also during the course of the project. In case, in case if there is any deviation, so you can find out or in case if you need to squeeze your schedule, you know that which activity you need to pay attention to. So you will monitor these critical activities very closely. You will do the resource allocation and if you have identified the critical path, you can do it by having minimum impact on the overall project schedule. Okay. In case if you need to squeeze your schedule or you need to cover up, you need to, there is a delay and you need to take some, uh, 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 you know, corrective actions or you need to fast track your project so you know which are the activities you need to pay attention to. So there is a point what paths are high risk. Yes, the critical path means it is on a very high risk with respect to the schedule. Remember this word critical has absolutely nothing to do with the nature of the work. It is associated only with the criticality of that task with respect to schedule. The impact of that, impact of the schedule of the task on the overall project completion date. And that's the reason we need to identify the critical path. Yes, Tambi, you are absolutely correct. This is for the prioritization. Which task should get priority, which one should not. So with this, uh, we need to understand one more topic with respect to the critical path, the float. So there are two type of float. There are actually multiple types of float, but I will talk about only these two. One is a total float and second is a free float. Just remember, the definition can be confusing right now, but remember, whenever we talk about total, the moment you see this word total, it means we are talking about the impact of delay on the overall project duration. Whenever we talk about the free float, it means we are talking about the impact of delay on the successor or next activity. In PMP examination, if you see this word just float, if it is written only float, do not get confused whether it is a free float or total float. Float or total float is one and same thing. If PMI has to ask you any question specific to the free float, they will write it explicitly as a free float. Okay. So, is it clear to everyone? And formula for float or total float is simple LS minus ES 
or LF minus EF, which is here. You need to calculate LF minus EF for each activity and you'll find the float. Now, the formula for free float, free float means amount of time by which an activity can be delayed without affecting the successor or next activity. So how to calculate the free float is early start of successor. For example, if I ask you, what is the free float of task C? So free float of task C means early start of successor. What is the successor of C? Task F. And what is the early start of F? 22. 22 minus early finish of the predecessor. Which is the predecessor activity here? C. So 22 minus 20. And because we are using day 1 as our base or the starting day, we need to do minus 1. So 22 minus 20 minus 1 is your 1 which is your free float. In this example, our total float and free float is same. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, float for this task and free float is same. But you may get a very complex question in the PMP examination where it will be different. Uh, Anthony, you lost my voice. Are you all able to hear me clearly? Can you just confirm it on the chat window? Okay, so maybe Anthony, you need to check something on your side. I'm so sorry for this uh, inconvenience. Okay, so Rodi has a question. Task A and task C each have float of one. Okay. Okay, okay, I got uh, uh, your point. So when I say calculate the total float, total float does not mean that you're going to do this one plus one. No, we do not calculate for the total float for the entire project. No, the word float, be it total float or be it free float, it is always with respect to one single activity. The only difference is total float means amount of time by which one particular activity can be delayed without impacting your overall project duration, overall project finish date. Okay. And when we talk about the free float, amount of time by which an activity can be delayed without impacting the next task. Do not think that the moment you see total, you have to add up entire float. No, never. You will never ever do that. Okay. Randy, very interesting question. On the PMP examination, would we expect to see a diagram like this? No, you will never get this diagram. But what you need to, you are going to get this in the text form. It will be in a paragraph form. So whenever you do get this question for the critical path, do not try to do any mental calculation, mental math. You will be given a piece of paper and a pencil. Draw exactly similar kind of diagram in the rough notebook which is given to you. Okay, put four corners in each of the box and calculate early start, early finish, late start, late, late finish for each activity and connect them as per the sequence or uh, uh, predecessor information given in the question. Then only you should do that. Okay. So this is the way we are going to identify our critical path. So I hope I was able to explain this and uh, uh, you are all clear with the critical path now. And you understand the difference in total park uh, float and free float. Okay. Okay. Yes, Sanjeev, there can be situation where free float and total float for each activity can have different values. Sometime your free float can be of, let's say five days and your total float for that activity will be one day, uh, or let's say two days. It means uh, that depends on the relationship I mean sequencing that depends on how many predecessors you have. See in a real life scenario in a real life project your project network diagram is not going to look so simple. It will be very complex you know and there may be multiple successor to one activity each leading into a different path. So yes it is possible it can happen. Okay. 
So I hope I answered your question clearly. Great. Thank you. So let's move to the next topic. So this is all about the critical path. And uh, uh, always remember, do not try to do any mental calculation. Use the paper and pencil which is given to you. Okay. Critical path is very important from the examination point of view because you may get around six to seven questions uh, or only from this one single topic. And the key to success uh, or the key to answer this, these questions correctly is practice. Practice, practice and practice. Do a lot of numericals. When you go to our LMS, uh, you will find a lot of numerical questions here and they are very strolling. So with this, uh, we move to the next topic, which is very interesting on value management and again, equally important with respect to examination. Let me just check the time what it is because I do not want to go beyond one o'clock. I mean, uh, the time because project management is all about making sure the project gets over in time within scope, within cost. So I had to ensure that we finish everything within the quality standard, quality parameters, within time and within scope. So without wasting any time, I'll quickly go to the earn value management and all the value management is a very, very effective way to check your project's health. Okay. It is made up of all mathematical, mathematical formulas that, uh, with, that will help you to compare your work performance against work plan or in a simple way, variance analysis, comparison of your plan versus work, actual work is your earn value. Okay. And earn value is a very, very important part of cost control. When we talk about this process here, uh, control cost, the very, this activity that you do here, the key activity you do here is control, sorry, not risk. I'm sorry, control cost. The activity, key activity you do here is earn value and the information or the outcome of this earn value analysis is also used in your control schedule. How? Let us understand this. So I will go back to the notepad, uh, sorry, MS Paint and let me show you that. Okay. And okay, so let's say I have a project, and that project has a duration of five days, and the budget for this project is ten thousand dollars. This is my project. Project has a duration of five days and the budget for this project is $10,000. Okay. In other words, I can, uh, in other words, I can say that in five days time, I'm planning to complete work worth $10,000. I can say it this way also. Okay. So the point that I'm trying to make here is whenever we talk about earned value, it is always with respect to the dollar value associated with that project. So with respect to earn value, how I'm going to call it is that in five days time, I'm going to complete work worth $10,000. Okay. So this $10,000 will be called as my BAC. BAC is budget at completion. So when you get go through the slide or video later in detail, you will see that all these acronyms are given here in detail. You need not to worry about anything here. Everything is written here in the slides. Okay. So let me get back to the paint here. And then I make my plan and I decide to finish this in five days. Oh, okay. So this is my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. In five days time, I had to finish this project. And what I decide that every day 
I will finish work worth two thousand dollars. Okay. In other words, I can say that I am targeting to complete work worth two thousand dollars every day. Okay. So I make a plan of that and I save baseline. That means I freeze my plan and I start working on it. I save the baseline and I start working on it and I work till Wednesday. On Wednesday, I want to do a health check. Wednesday is the day when I'm doing earn value analysis to find out how I'm doing with respect to cost and schedule of the project. Okay. So at this point of time, I need to do some analysis and for that analysis, I need some values. So first of all, I'll find need to find out. I'm sorry. Uh, this arrow has to be extended till here. How I'm doing with respect to scope, uh, sorry, time and cost till Wednesday. So I need to calculate some values. First of all, I need to find out how much work I have. I was supposed to complete till that time. So that means I need to find out what is the total value of work planned till date. So that is work worth $6,000 because I am doing this analysis on end of Wednesday. So Wednesday is Monday, Tuesday plus Wednesday. I need to add up the money that I'm planning to spend there, which comes to $6,000. And this will be called as planned value or PV. I also need to find out how much work I have done so far. So let us assume that in three days time, I was supposed to complete 10 tasks. I was supposed planning to complete 10 tasks. And when I look at the actual, I realized that I had completed only six tasks. It means actual work done till Wednesday. Is, oh, I'm sorry, I again did not do it till Wednesday here. This actually has to be extended till here. Uh, okay, these 10 tasks are actually coming till Wednesday. Please uh, uh, excuse me for what I did here. Okay. So till this time, I was supposed to complete 10 tasks, but I have completed only six tasks. It means the work done is 60% of the plan till date. Six out of 10 means 60%. And that is my earned value. Earned value is 60% of the plan till date. That is $3,600. Okay. Is it clear to everyone? How did I come to uh, this earned values? Any question, please type it because it's, it's very important that you understand this. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will explain it. So Sheffer is, Sheffer is asking me to explain that again. Okay. So let me draw a fresh one. I, I understand it might be confusing. I'll just draw it separately here. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. I was supposed to spend 2K, 2K and 2K. All three days. is, I was supposed to complete work worth $2,000, $2,000, $2,000 on all these three days. That comes to your $6,000. Okay. When I look at my actual, I realize that I was supposed to complete 10 tasks till Wednesday. In three days time, I was supposed to complete 10 tasks. But when I look at my progress report, I realize that I have completed only six tasks. So what is the value of these six tasks which I completed? It's a 60% because I was supposed to complete 10 tasks. I have completed only six tasks. So the progress is 60% of the plan. And when I need to write down the value of that, how I will calculate this is 60% of the work plan till date. So that is 3,600. 
सिक्सटी परसेंट ऑफ सिक्स थाउजेंड इज थ्री थाउजेंड सिक्स हंड्रेड यस एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट डेनिस सिक्स टास्क आउट ऑफ टेन मिस नो इट विल आई एम एज्यूमिंग आई एम एज्यूमिंग दैट द वर्क इज स्प्रेड आउट इक्वली ओके इन पीएमपी एग्जामिनेशन दे मे गिव यू स्पेसिफिक वैल्यूज बट हियर आई एम जस्ट एज्यूमिंग दैट the work is spread evenly across all the days okay thank you and now i need to find out how much money i spend doing this work so i need to calculate my actual cost so i go to my finance department and i ask them and they inform me that till wednesday you ended up spending 4000 dollars on this project Okay. so this is my actual cost so let us understand it this way from monday till wednesday i was supposed to complete work worth 6000 dollars that was my plan when i look at my actual progress actual work done i realize that i did only six tasks out of 10 tasks scheduled till that it means the actual progress is 60% of the plan till date which is 60% of 6000 so 3600 and when i get this from accounts department i realize that in order to do work worth 3600 dollars i ended up spending 4000 dollars okay so these are three basic values that we must identify we must find out okay pmp exam you will get some different values but again you need to find out what is a pv what is a ev and what is a ac the questions that you are going to go get there is are going to be complex but always remember the most complex questions or the problem be it life be it your professional work environment the solution of those problems is basics go to basics be it critical path be it on value you must always go to basics first calculate these three values you may not be having enough information to calculate three values use certain formulas these are the formulas given to you which are there in the pembok also check those formulas and find out these values okay these are the basic formulas which are in the slide which you are going to receive there using this formulas find out these basic values and then you start calculating your variances we'll calculate the variance here so first we'll calculate the cost variance what is the variance with respect to or let's calculate the schedule variance first formula for schedule variance is on value minus plan value so on value minus plan value value means sv for this project is equal to what is the on value 3600 dollars minus what is the plan value that is 6000 dollars this comes to a negative value of 2400 dollars so in other words i can say i am behind the schedule by work worth 2400 dollars now i'll calculate my cost variance so the formula for the cost variance is on value minus actual cost which is so cv will be for this project will be on value is 3600 dollars minus actual cost sorry it's not av but it is ac actual cost for this is $4000 so the cost variance for this in this project is a negative value of $400 so whenever you see this negative values it means it's not a good news sv negative means you're behind schedule by work worth so many dollars 
Your cost variance negative means you are overspending by so many dollars. You can read it from here also. You are supposed to complete work worth six thousand dollars, but you completed work worth three thousand six hundred dollars only. And in order to do work worth three thousand six hundred dollars, you ended up spending four thousand dollars. So you are overspending by four hundred dollars. Is it clear? Okay, so Stephanie is asking, uh, $4,000, $4, where did it come from? This $4,000 is a number, I have taken a random number. So you, it depends whether you are tracking the finances of this project or not. So suppose in order to do certain work, you have to spend some money. How that is possible? Okay, so let me draw it here. Actually, let me draw that in PPT. I feel... A bit comfortable there. Okay. So there is a task which has a plan duration of two days, or let's say the total work for that task is sixteen hours. And the resource working on that has a standard rate of $100 or let's say $10, $20 an hour. So the planned cost for this activity will be what? 16 multiplied by 20 is equal to $320. $320 is the plan cost. Now we started working on this activity and this activity got delayed. It got delayed by, let's say, 8 hours. 8 additional hours. And now, if we look at the actual cost, so this is going to be 20 hours multiplied by $20, sorry, 24 hours multiply by $20 an hour. So this will be 24 multiplied by 20. So this will be $480. So this $480 is my actual cost. So if you are tracking the cost, you can get this uh, uh, $480 from your cost tracking sheet or you can get it from your finance department departments. Is it clear, Stephanie? So I'm just take, making a wild guess that, you know, the actual cost is $4,000. Okay, so Anthony has a point. How do you turn this, actually, this into EVA report? So EVA report is, uh, we will use this as the basic value, basic data, and then we go to these formulas. We go to all these formulas where we calculate our CPI and SPI, which I'm going to tell you that. And based on that, we are also going to do some forecasting. So using all these formulas, we do not have luxury of time to go through each and every formula. And if you go to your PMBOK, I will show you, I'll tell you the page number. Dennis, give me a minute, please. I'll get back to your question. So let me just take you through the area of earn value. So if you go to page number 217 you'll see the earn value management topic there and then they have given all this abbreviation all these values and then there are formulas here okay so if you go to page number 220 you'll see the formulas for your forecasting and then there is a sheet there is a page here which gives you a list of all the formulas this is page number 224. Make note of this page. Take a printout of this sheet. Put it in your desk. This must be in front of you all the time. You need to understand these formulas. Memorization of this formula will definitely help, but you must understand the logic behind it because the questions that you're going to get are going to be very complex. Okay. And you need to, if you understand the logic behind it, if you understand the 
the concept behind it you will be able to you need not to memorize the formula but you will be able to calculate these values at your own okay so dennis has a question as ac is the money actually taken from your account at that point of project yes including any unplanned expenses as well yes absolutely correct dennis so actual cost can also be called as a sunk cost okay uh, normally in the project the word that is used for this is sunk cost sunk cost is total money that you have spent so far including any unplanned expenses any deviation any single uh, penny that you have spent so what you need to do is you need to find out these basic values and we will also calculate some indexes now so first is your spi which is your schedule performance index and the formula for this is simple on value divided by plan value which means 3600 divided by $6000 so this will sorry $6000 so this will be 0.6 this is a formula for SPI that is schedule performance index now we will calculate our CPI i'll explain you these values give me a minute this is on value divided by actual cost it means $3600 divided by $4000 so that means 0.9 so your spi is 0.6 and cpi is 0.9 for this project the benchmark for both cpi and spi is 1 less than 1 in both the indexes is not a good news 1 means you are absolutely on track with respect to scope and cost and more than 1 you are ahead of schedule and you are spending less so if your spi is 0.6 it means you are behind the schedule Uh, by some values for every dollar that you are spending on the project you are getting only 60 cents in return the value that you are getting it getting back from the project is just 60% of the plan cpi means less than 1 means overspending so for every dollar that you are spending on the project the value that you are getting in return is 90 cents okay and uh, more than 1 means let's say your spi is 1.1 it means you are ahead of schedule cpi more than 1 is you are spending less okay so uh, please go to this page number 224 of pimbok make a note of this page and you must have these formulas on your fingertips because the questions that you are going to receive in the pim PMP examination will be complex, but again, they will try to make it look complex. But if you are able to calculate these basic values, there is nothing called as difficult or nothing called complex question. It's just a state of mind. Okay, memorize. Try to understand this formula. If you have to, you may have to memorize some of the formulas as well. But again, when you go for the examination, um, you know, not necessary that the question will require the formula to be used exactly as it is okay so uh, in this slides also when you receive when you going to get this you will have the formulas here you can go through that again but is everyone clear with the basics that we calculated schedule variance cost variance spi and cpi or anyone has any question on that please write it in the chat window in case of any question there are some hands raised let me just look at that okay sanjeev is your question answered i can see your hand raised okay in the interpretation column on your slide what is the abbreviation ve okay positive sorry it is uh, it is negative or positive okay So I'll assume it is clear. So it's it's nothing. It's just negative and positive. Okay, okay. I got your point. So maybe what I can do is to make it easier. I'll just remove this ve and I'll just say negative. Negative is over budget, over budget, and positive is under budget. Does it? Does this simplifies it? Okay, great. thank you
Thank you. So this is your earned value management and the basics of earned value management. Of course, there is a lot to it, uh, but these are the basics. And uh, since everyone is okay, uh, we are good to move to the next topic. So I will uh, pause for a minute and I will sip some water. In case if you have any question, please feel free to ask now. Okay. Fantastic. And with this, uh, we come towards the uh, end of the session. And the last topic of the day is project risk management. So project risk management is, uh, again, uh, a very important topic, slightly complex as well. And uh, with respect to the PMP examination, there are certain topics which will be, will be quite uh, important to understand. In terms of uh, real life application of this risk management, it's very, very crucial and very important because this is something that uh, people normally do not take care of. What they do is they just make a risk management plan. They just prepare a risk register and there is no follow up. There is no action on that. So identifying risk is one thing, but tracking, monitoring, controlling and managing the risk is another important thing. So Perry, Perry has uh, raised her hands, his uh, raised hands. Can you please uh, type in your question? If you have any point. Perry, you have any question? Can you uh, type it in the ch chat window? Questions window? Okay, no problem. Thank you. So risk is uh, any event that can impact your project, be it negatively or positively. Okay. So it's very, very important to understand or to identify what can go wrong in your project. It's very important to understand if there are any event that you foresee and if that happen, how, to what extent uh, it can impact your project. Okay, the project, the objective of the entire risk management is to increase the likelihood and impact of the positive event and decrease the probability, likelihood or impact of the negative events. So you can take some preventive actions to minimize that. So I hope all of you understand the preventive action and corrective actions. Okay, let me ask you a simple question. Suppose I... I have a dream that I want to construct a beautiful villa on lakeside, somewhere in the lakeside. I live in Bangalore and Bangalore is famous for its lake. Of course, they are being, uh, you know, going down the drain now. But assuming that I have a dream and I'm able to fulfill my dream at some point of time, I buy a villa and day one, I shift into my villa. I'm sitting in the lawn, enjoying my cup of tea in the evening. But unfortunately, that place is full of mosquitoes. I get the mosquito bite. Night, I get fever. I go to hospital. Unfortunately, I am diagnosed with malaria. I remain in hospital for four days. I get the treatment, come back home. First thing that I do after coming back home is I do a pest control. So that I do not get that. Uh, um, uh, in uh, disease again. So tell me this pest control is a corrective action or a preventive action. Okay, she can't say it's corrective. And uh, Shepar says preventive. Mike says corrective. Seal says both. And Anthony, Shivakumar, Anthony says correct, preventive. Okay, mixed question. So tell me, if that is a corrective action, then what was it when I went to hospital and got the treatment done? Absolutely, Shrikant, you're correct. So when I got this mosquito bite, I went to hospital and I was diagnosed with malaria. It means there was some damage which was done. And to do the damage control, I received the treatment for malaria and that was corrective action. When I come back, I am perfectly all right. I am well, but I do not want the reoccurrence of that event. I ensure that I am taking certain steps which will minimize the likelihood of this in the future. So that will be called as preventive action. Okay, you may get questions like this in PMP examination, which where you need to understand what is corrective and what is preventive. 
So thanks a lot for answering this question and I hope it is clear to everyone the corrective and preventive action. Okay. So what we will do is when you identify a risk, you will take some preventive action and you will also look at refer to your historical data, the projects done in past, you find out the lessons learned from, from there and then you will uh, you know, base your action. But suppose during the course of the project, some event happened and your project work is delayed or deviated. So you will do the damage control at the same time you will take some actions which will help you prevent uh, which will uh, prevent the reoccurrence of that event again. Okay. So for risk management first is very important to understand what is the difference in risk and issue. Remember whenever you are talking about any uncertain event in future we are talking about risk and if we are talking about any event which has already happened, it means there is no question of any uncertainty there. It has happened already. We are into that situation that is called as issue. For risk, we will prepare our preventive action plan. We will also make strategies that in case if that risk happens, uh, how we are going to treat that. We will identify certain steps that we need to take in case that that risk happens and issue if that risk turns out to be true, it happens, then you are going to implement that strategy, execute that strategy that you had planned. You will implement those actions that you had already documented earlier. And you will definitely get questions like this in PMP examination where you first need to judge and understand whether it is a uh, risk or it is issue. Always remember if the event has already happened, it is no longer a risk. It is an issue and you will not do any risk planning or any mitigation plan or anything, but you are going to execute the strategy or you're going to implement the actions that you had identified earlier. Okay. In case if any event that was unplanned, you had not anticipated that it will happen. Then again, it will be an issue, but you will not have any strategy for that. You may not have any action plan for that. And that is the time when you will have to use a work around. Okay. So you may get a question like this. And uh, if you go to our LMS, when you uh, do go to LMS, there are a few questions I have added there specifically, which will highlight the difference and highlight the importance of this risk issue workaround and contingencies. Okay. So once you have identified all the risk, you need to define your strategy first that you know what will fall into the category of risk. Uh, you need to prepare your risk management plan as per this process here that I showed in page number 61 of PMBOK. In the risk plan risk management, you will identify what will define any event as a risk. You will also identify what are the possible sources of that risk. You will prepare your risk breakdown structure. You will identify the different sources of the risk and you will prepare a comprehensive list, list of all the risks and those risks will be documented in a in an excel sheet or any document which will be called as risk register. So once you have prepared a risk register you need to start quantifying or you need to start doing your probability and impact analysis. So probability is what is the likelihood of the event that event occurrence of that event. So you can rate this, you can put this into, uh, you can give it a score there, uh, score from, uh, you know, your uh, uh, one to five, one can be low and uh, five can be very high. And you also need to calculate what is the impact for that. Okay. So probability is uh, uh, one is very low, five is very high. For example, uh, there is a risk attrition. So you should not write this as it is in your risk register that attrition is a risk. No, you have to be as detailed as possible that key resource may resign during the project. This is a risk. Okay. Elaborate is as, as, as uh, much as possible. And 
then what is the probability? And if I ask you to give a score between one to five, how would you do that? How will you reach to a number? Of course, you need to look at the historical data. How many times it has happened? Okay. If I talk about, uh, let's say, rain during a particular time during the construction project, in an IT project, I can talk about network outage. In a pharma project, I can talk about uh, clinical trial fails. So you will have to look at the historical data that what was the success ratio in all this test result. And if your historical data says that 80% of the time, the test results were positive or, or is the, the test results were within limit or they passed the uh, uh, parameters, uh, limits, then you will say the failure ratio expected to be 20%. So the likelihood is that this air test will fail is 20%. In case of key resource resigning, there cannot be any number, but you will have to rely on your gut feeling because you are the manager, you are having a one-on-one -on -one with that uh, resource uh, every week or maybe every month. And every time for past six months when you talk to that resource, he is asking for a raise. He says, my liabilities have increased. I have been working at this salary for past five years and now I need the increment because I have some other offer from other companies. Okay. That may be the situation or that person might not be uh, uh, loving the work that you have given him. So using your gut feeling, you will say that, okay, I know the likelihood of this person resigning is very high. Now you need to find out if that person resigns, what will be the impact of that? That impact can also differ from time to time. Let's say that person is a, uh, is a test engineer. Okay. Now, test engineer is required when the project reaches to an execution stage, you have work results, deliverables coming in and you need to do the testing of that. Okay. So during that phase, if that resource resigns, it may have a impact. So it can deviate the project by 10 days. So find out what is the overall duration, how long it may take you to get the replacement for that resource. And what will be the delay in getting the replacement of that uh, resource and overall, what will be the impact on the duration? So suppose the total impact on the duration is let's assume of three days time and the overall project duration is two years. Then this impact is actually negligible because that can be a part of your, that can be uh, covered up from, from the, the buffer that you have or the float that you have in certain situation. But let's say the total duration of the project is one month or let's say three weeks and there you are looking for a delay of three days and that delay can be a major one. So you need to look at all these factors. You need to look at the historical data and based on that rate this risk, uh, uh, you know, give the scoring to this risk for the impact. Again, the score will be one will be low and five will be very high and then use your probability multiplied by impact. So that is going to give you the risk score. Okay. And that risk score will be very useful. And based on this score, you, you can also define that who is the right person or this must be escalated to what level in case if this risk happens. Okay. So this probability and impact matrix is, uh, it's very easy but uh, quite important to understand. And there was a question, I don't remember the name, someone asked about the quantitative risk analysis. So quantitative risk analysis is when we go to the next stage where we, uh, we start calculating the monetary value associated with each of the risk. Okay, for example, one of the risks that you identified is key resource may resign and you are looking for options to keep some people um, um, in the backup. So there are two resources available who can actually be the replacement, uh, who can be, uh, who can backfill the position. One of the resource has a cost of $10,000. Second resource has a cost of $12,000. So using that decision entry analysis, using the Monte Carlo analysis, you will find out which resource is more useful. Quantitative risk analysis, the, the process, the, the techniques and tools and techniques in quantitative analysis are used 
to find out that if you have to invest some amount of money, what is the return that you're going to get? And if you have two options, for example, investment, if you have $50,000 spare in your pocket and you have to invest that money somewhere. So there are two options, whether you want to invest that money into the stock or you want to invest that money into a startup company. Okay. So you will do this analysis that if I invest it in stock, the likelihood of this getting double in next two years is 80%. Likelihood of this value becoming zero is 20%. Or likelihood of this uh, coming down from 50,000 to 30,000 is 20%. If you invested this in a startup, the likelihood of this going triple in three, two years time is 75%. And the likelihood of this value becoming zero in next three years is 25%. So based on that, you are going to do the calculation and that will help you take a decision that whether you should invest it in a startup or you should invest it in a stock market. Okay. Unfortunately, I have not included that topic here in this slide deck because, uh, you know, the time is too little and I did not want to rush up on all the topics so that we can complete everything in time. If you have any specific questions which, which you felt is... Uh, uh, you were not answered here or if you want to know uh, something uh, more in detail please feel free to let me know and uh, I'll see how I can help you on that so uh, any questions on uh, the this uh, PI matrix for the risk management okay so with this we come to the end of the session and I hope I was able to add some value to the existing knowledge of uh, uh, your PMP and project management and Sanjeev is asking are there further sessions coming up on PMP uh, free webinars yes we are going to plan uh, we have a, a series of webinars planned but uh, you know they will not be as long as this one is they will be one hour because it's not possible for everyone to you know pull out uh, that amount of time on a regular basis so we will have very soon we are going to have series of webinars one hour one hour one hour probably 45 minutes where we'll pick up on certain topics of it but if you're looking for the pmp exam preparation these webinar webinars will not uh, uh, suffice you will have to go for this full four day pmp exam preparation workshop and the good news for all the uh, attendees of this session is we are running a special offer on uh, May Day, on a Labor Day, to honor the laborers, to honor the workforce across the globe. We have this 50% flat discount going on on the courses, and this is valid only till 3rd May. Okay. So uh, you're going to get the details, you're going to get the mail, uh, uh, you know, uh, after this uh, webinar, probably in a day or two days time, which will have the link to uh, the recording and the slides here and if you want you can get in touch at these numbers with the people here to help you enroll for the courses in case if you're interested if you have any questions please feel free to write into me my contact details will be shared with you in the email that you receive okay and uh, after this mail uh, sorry after this session you are all going to receive a uh, feedback a link for the feedback where you can give please feel free to give your feedback and I request everyone's feedback because if you feel that I have been able to add value to it and I was uh, uh, you know uh, genuine in putting in my effort and most importantly this session will give you six PDUs and for that we are going to issue certificates and for that certificate we need to know your correct name and exact name so when you receive that link when you receive that link uh, for the for the feedback, please write in your complete name in bold, in capital, which you want to be published in the certificate. And write that in the comment or the feedback section. So we can issue the PDO certificate and help you with that. Shrikant, wish you all the very best and uh, you will have my details. Uh, you'll have my contact details. Please feel free to call me anytime that you want. I wish you all the best for your... Uh, uh, for your PMP examination and I'm sure I'm positive you'll be able to clear that okay and uh, there was another point from uh, 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 Sanjeev no no okay uh, Sanjeev asked if mock PMP exam questions are discussed that would be great uh, Sanjeev you can see the the topic the the 
elaboration of the topic and the vastness of the subject, it was not possible to discuss these questions here. But uh, I will be able to help you with that. So with this, we can sign off. We are two minutes ahead of schedule. If you do not have any question, uh, we can sign off. If you have anything, I'll be here for two more minutes. I wish all of you very best. And I'm sure you will do good in your PMP examination. I'm still waiting. Please write in your questions if you have any. Okay, uh, Randy, I will write in. I will hold on. I will give you my contact information right away. Okay, hold on guys, I'm giving my information. Okay, I sent it to all. So this is my phone number and this is my email address. Thanks Sanjeev, I will, I'll accept that request. Thanks Vinod, thanks Shanti. Thanks a lot Perry, thank you Rory. Thanks a lot Anthony. Okay, so we are all set to sign off from the session and I will close this and again, uh, see you wish to connect with you in some time word is small we never know when we are going to cross roads again and wish you all the best again bye bye